Want to speak real English from your first lesson? Sign up for your free lifetime account at EnglishClass101.com. Top 10 language learning strategies. Let's begin. Befriending or dating someone who speaks English. Watching movies or listening to music in English. Read English newspapers or magazines. Record your voice and compare your pronunciation with native English speakers. Download dialogue tracks and listen to English conversations. Repeat the phrases that you hear out loud again and again. Review all the lessons on EnglishClass101.com to master them completely. Read lines slowly at first, then reread and increase your speed. Set small and measurable learning goals with your personal deadlines. Try harder lessons to challenge yourself and improve faster. 10 ways to stop translating in your head. Let's get started. Identify objects around you in English. The first way to stop translating in your head is to identify the objects around you in your target language. So if you're studying English, that means you look at the objects around the room, look at the things in your life. Don't think of them in your native language first. Think of them in your target language first. So if I look around the room, I see a computer, I shouldn't think my native language word, I should think my target language word. So start with the items and the situations in your everyday life. If I say computer in English, maybe I should say computa in Japanese. I should say not, I don't know, water in English. I should say omizu in Japanese. So start associating the words in your target language with your everyday life now. So if you're studying English, that means start getting familiar with the things in your everyday life in English. Repeat phrases you hear native speakers use. Tip number two is to repeat the phrases that you hear native speakers use. So if you're watching this channel, for example, or you're watching a TV show or a movie, uh, listen for the way that native speakers make those phrases. If you hear a phrase you have never heard before, or you hear an interesting combination of words, try to repeat them yourself. Don't just listen. Try to say them yourself. If you're in a public space and it's difficult for you to do that, fine. Practice in a place where you feel more comfortable. Maybe if you have some private space to practice. Just repeat them. Get your mouth used to saying the words the way that the speakers, uh, the native speakers do. So if you never actually say words, if you're only taking in, if you're only listening and you're not actually producing the language, it's, it's kind of hard to, uh, to practice and to, um, to really hone your pronunciation, to improve your pronunciation. So when you listen to native speakers, try to repeat after them. So for example, if you're studying English, you can try to repeat after this video. You can repeat after the things I'm saying because maybe I'm using an expression or I'm using a certain uh, series of vocabulary words together the way a native speaker would. And it's a, maybe a good idea to try to practice the ways that native speakers put their words together. So try to repeat after native speakers, especially when you're looking at media. Uh, and you can do this when you're reading books too. You can try to read out, um, read out loud interesting lines of books that you find or something that maybe is difficult for you. Very nice practice tip. Make a situation where you can't escape into your native language. Make a situation where you can't escape into your native language essentially means immerse yourself. Of course, going to that country or going to a place uh, where you can speak only that language is very difficult for some of you. Totally understand. But if in your life you can create a situation in your library, in your room, in your house, somewhere, for just an hour or I don't know, maybe a day, I don't know what your schedule is like, but if you can create a situation or create an environment where you have no choice but to use that language and you cannot escape, meaning you cannot uh, go back to using your native language as a crutch, you can't use the native language at all, it forces you to use the language that you're studying. So of course, if you are lucky enough to live in the country or to live in a place 
where people speak the language you're studying, great, but you have to go out and interact with people. You have to put yourself in a place where you have no choice but to speak. It's very hard and it's very scary and it's very embarrassing at first, but if you take time to find places and to make environments that are comfortable for you, where you feel comfortable making mistakes and asking questions, it's very valuable for your learning process. This is actually something that I did, totally. I totally did this. My Japanese wasn't very good for a long time, but then I started making friends who could not speak English. Uh, actually, I just did this through finding hobbies. There was a hobby that I had. I joined a group, I joined actually a school to where I could learn how to do that hobby. And everything was taught only in Japanese. And the people in my class only spoke Japanese, mostly. And then maybe we would go out for drinks and food、uh, late at night or on the weekends, and everybody spoke only Japanese. And if I couldn't communicate even simply in Japanese, I had no hope of keeping that friendship together. So it forced me to study, it forced me to think about the words they were using、uh, and to try to learn those words, those patterns, as well as how to produce them naturally myself. So I was learning the vocabulary words the people around me were using and learning how to apply them on my own. That was only possible because I had no escape <laughs> in those situations. So try to do that,、uh, even if you can do it yourself in your house. It's super helpful, I think. Watch TV and movies in your target language without subtitles. Tip number four is to watch TV and movies in your target language without subtitles. Without subtitles. So I think that watching、uh, with subtitles can be very beneficial.、Um, so if I'm watching something, or if you want to watch something with subtitles on, great. But I sometimes find that、uh, I can, in my case, I, I think too much about reading the subtitles and I forget to listen. So maybe if you've seen a movie in your target language a few times、um, with the subtitles on, try turning the subtitles off and think about. The like, character's body language, the words they're using.、Um, you can always look that up later, look up the, you know, the words you don't know in a dictionary. But try to do it、um, where you're focusing completely on the way that people are using their words. Try not to use the subtitles. So、um, kind of play around with it a little bit. If there's a word that's difficult for you to hear, you can actually turn on the subtitles in, like, the, in the native、uh, language of the movie as well. That's something that I've done. Like if,、uh, like, if I wanted to study Japanese, it's very useful when the actual words spoken in Japanese appear on the screen. Sometimes it's easier for me to catch a word if I see it visually and I hear it at the same time. So, another way to kind of、um, explore how you can use TV and movies is to actually turn on the closed captions, like the, the,、um, the words on the screen. In the native language of the movie. So,、uh, so, this is sort of two points in one. So, one, watch movies without subtitles, meaning subtitles in your native language. And hint two is to watch movies、um, with closed captioning on, but the closed captioning is in your target language, not in your native language. So, you can try those two things with TV and with、um, movies. Don't bring a dictionary to your lesson. Tip number five is don't bring a dictionary to your lesson. Okay, so、uh, give me a second here. So I understand that dictionaries, especially electronic dictionaries, we have them on our phones now, are very, very convenient.、Um, of course, it's important to use them and it's they're a great resource to have. However, one thing that、uh, really bothers me and that I think is detrimental, it's not helpful for students, is when Uh, students are in a lesson and they're practicing conversation, and they reach a point in the conversation where they don't know the word they want to use. They know it in their native language and they don't know how to say it in their target language. They pull out their dictionary, they say to the, the person listening to them, their practice partner in their lesson where they have a limited period of time, just a moment. And then they look it up on their phone and it takes A few seconds, the, the flow of the conversation stops, and then they say a word. And it's like, whoa, no, that's not, you don't have that ability. You don't have the ability to do that in a conversation with a native speaker. Most people, like if you go to a bank and try to open a bank account, are you really going to pull out your dictionary and sit there and try to 
communicate, you know, just a moment, just a moment. As you look up each word you don't know, no. Or if you do, that's not a real conversation. So instead, try using a different strategy. By that I mean, if you find a word you don't know in conversation, explain the word to your conversation partner. Maybe they know the word. If you're speaking with a native speaker, this is a chance for them to teach you a word. I find that when people take the time to teach me a word, I remember the word much better than just looking it up on my dictionary. So try to resist. Maybe you can bring a dictionary to your lesson, but don't use it or try not to use it in your conversation practice. It's just, it destroys the flow of a conversation. So instead, practice the skill of describing the vocabulary word you want to use and learn how to ask the meaning of a word or learn how to ask for a vocabulary word from your partner. So you can use an expression like, ah, what's the word that means blah, blah, blah. Or, um, you know, it's this thing that does this and this and this. So this is an opportunity for you to describe characteristics of something or find a different way. You can use your body language. You can use whatever. You have a lot of tools, but try not to use a dictionary in a conversation because it's not realistic. Train responses to common questions. Number six is a quick one, I think. Number six, hint number six I have is just to train responses to common questions. Train responses to common questions. So for example, uh, a very common question in English is, hey, how are you? You should know how to answer this question. Just have a default response. Hey, how are you? I'm good. <laughs> like, if it takes you a long time to answer the question, hey, how are you? You need to practice. I think that's a pretty good uh, a pretty good indicator. So, for example, sometimes I ask students a question like that they they haven't quite gotten the idea of how to respond just yet. They they they're not so quick at responding. I say, uh, "Hey, how are you?" And they say, "Yes." And then they think and they go, "I'm uh, I'm uh, good." <laughs> and it's like that's a very common question. So think about just a default response that you can spit out that you can quickly say. If it's, "How was your weekend?" or "Hey, what's up?" or "What do you want to do for dinner tonight?" Think about like just a handful, meaning just a few responses to those questions and train them quickly. Just, "How are you?" "I'm good." "How are you?" "I'm okay." "How are you?" "Not bad." There's three. So it's just training responses to those questions. There's no reason to be surprised by a question like, how are you? Like, that's a very common question. So for those common questions, train responses to that. We've got a bunch of videos, especially beginner level videos for some example responses you can do. So don't get stuck with these little questions. Just train a few responses. Practice a few responses till they feel natural to you. It'll save you time and it'll help the person asking the question too to move forward in the conversation. Yay! Study with materials that don't provide a translation. The next tip is to study with materials that don't provide a translation. So by this I mean if you're using worksheets and, or some kind of textbook uh, or whatever, and it has your target language, the language you're studying, and it has your native language next to it. While this can be useful, I feel that if you can, studying your materials only in your target language and then simplified explanations for more detailed points also in your target language can be a little bit better. So. I, sh I don't want to say like you should only study things in your target language and nothing from your native language because of course like it's, it can be helpful sometimes to look up a word or to understand a grammar point in your native language. But where possible, if you can find something that provides simplified explanations in your target language, it can be really, really helpful because again, you're thinking, you're learning to think on like a simpler on a more basic level about the language you're studying in the language that you're studying. So this can be really, really good. So finding some materials to use where there's no translation. Maybe you can practice, um, of course, with, with books and with written materials, but also with like video materials as well. So there are a variety of different ways that you can um, find materials in your target language, um, like 
in video and TV. So some things to think about there are the level of vocabulary words people are using in the media content you're watching, um, who the media content is intended for, children, young adults, adults, uh, the speed at which the speaker is talking. So like I have the ability to change the level of difficulty of uh, videos based on the rate of speech, the vocabulary words that I use, and how many like idioms and things I use. So I could make a video very difficult. We could make a very like a very difficult video series by leveling up our vocabulary use or by speaking very quickly. Or as you might see in like our English in three minutes series, um, we can also use very simple vocabulary and speak at a low rate of speech. So maybe right now this is a very intermediate level video. So please think about that. So not just for um, written materials, but also for your audio and visual materials. Think about um, who your audience is, the level of the material, and so on. It can be really fun uh, and it can be helpful to think about um, your, your target language in your target language. All right, we're almost done. Study phrases in addition to single vocabulary. The next tip is study phrases in addition to single vocabulary words. So yes, of course, vocabulary is important, but I find it personally very, very useful to look at how a vocabulary word is used in a phrase because sometimes using it in a phrase helps you understand the nuance of that vocabulary word really, really well. So if I, like a word like crazy, for example, in English, depending on the situation where the word crazy is used, it could mean something different. It could mean like a person who is mentally confused or mixed up. It could also mean something really good. It could mean something really bad. So if we look only at the word crazy, it's quite difficult to understand really the meaning of the word. But if you look at the way the word is used in a phrase, you can get a lot more information. So take a look at the way people use words in phrases, not just as single vocabulary words. You can learn a lot more that way, I think. Do your daily activities in English where possible. The next tip is to do your daily activities in your target language. Uh, so if you're studying English, that means try to do some daily activities in English if possible. So this can be very, very boring stuff, but just think about it when you're doing the activity. So like right now, I'm filming a video for EnglishClass101.com or I'm going to work, I'm cooking breakfast, I'm doing the laundry. What do I have to do tomorrow? So Try thinking about your everyday life in English if you're studying English. Try thinking about your everyday activities, the people that you meet. What are you doing? So this is a way to help you practice your verbs. So if you don't know, if you're, I don't know, you're doing something at work and you're like, oh my gosh, how do I explain the, what's the verb for, you know, a picture? Like I want to blah, 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 a picture. What's the word? You can check a dictionary at that point and go, oh, it's draw. I, I need to use the verb draw for draw a picture. So you can find these little gaps in your everyday life, these little gaps in your knowledge, if you think about um, your everyday activities in your target language. If you don't think about it in your target language, you might not realize you have vocabulary gaps or phrase gaps here and there. So this is a really good and kind of funny, actually, way to study. Use a learner's dictionary for new words. The last tip is to use a learner's dictionary for new words. So in English, there are learner's dictionaries available in English. So uh, my favorite, my personal favorite is Merriam-Webster. Merriam-Webster is a fantastic dictionary resource. They're so interesting and they have tons of like historical information. I really do just sit and like read things on the dictionary page lately. It's true. But, um, of course, there's a definition, there's a meaning for words, there are example sentences for words, but Merriam-Webster also has what's called a learner's dictionary. If you find a word that you don't recognize, you can check it at, uh, in a dictionary, in a learner's dictionary, and it gives you a simplified, a simple explanation in simple English of that word. So instead of checking it in your native language, you can check it in your target language. So again, this helps you to understand the word um, that you are, that you're focused on, but you understand it from um, the language you're studying, not from your native language. So using a learner's dictionary can be really, really useful as well. <sighs> All right. How are your English listening skills? First, you'll see an image and hear a question. 
Next comes a short dialogue. Listen carefully and see if you can answer correctly. We'll show you the answer at the end. A man and a woman are talking. What are they going to do first? What do you want to do today? I want to go see a movie. Okay, I want to watch the baseball game on TV. Also, I want to go shopping. The baseball game starts at 1 o'clock. Okay, so let's see the movie first, and then you can watch the baseball game. All right, then we'll go shopping in the evening. What are they going to do first? A man and a woman are talking. What are they going to do first? What do you want to do today? I want to go see a movie. Okay, I want to watch the baseball game on TV. Also, I want to go shopping. The baseball game starts at 1 o'clock. Okay, so let's see the movie first, and then you can watch the baseball game. All right, then we'll go shopping in the evening. A teacher and a student are talking. When will the student go to the teacher's office? I didn't really understand today's class. I see. What was confusing? Several things. Do you have time now? Actually, I'm a little busy. Could you come to my office in the afternoon? I'll be there from 1 p.m. to 4 p.m. Okay. I'll be there at 2 p.m. When will the student go to the teacher's office? A teacher and a student are talking. When will the student go to the teacher's office? I didn't really understand today's class. I see. What was confusing? Several things. Do you have time now? Actually, I'm a little busy. Could you come to my office in the afternoon? I'll be there from 1 p.m. to 4 p.m. Okay, I'll be there at 2 p.m. A woman is having lunch in a restaurant. What is she going to order? Would you like to have coffee or dessert after the meal? What desserts do you have? We have pudding and apple pie. Hmm. Actually, I'll just have coffee. Do you want cream or sugar? Cream, please. What is she going to order? A woman is having lunch in a restaurant. What is she going to order? Would you like to have coffee or dessert after the meal? What desserts do you have? We have pudding and apple pie. Hmm. Actually, I'll just have coffee. Do you want cream or sugar? Cream, please. Did you get it? Good evening, in-room dining. This is Alex. How may I be of service? Hello. I would like to order some food. Of course, ma'am. Just to confirm, this is Mrs. Rawson in room 417? Yes, it is. Excellent. May I take your order? Yes, I would like a turkey sandwich on a Parmesan bagel. And what to drink? A Diet Coke. Will there be anything else? Yes, I would also like a wake-up call for seven. A woman is waiting for a man. Where is the woman now? Hey, really sorry, but it looks like I'll be 30 minutes late. Okay, I'll wait for you at the cafe. Cafe? Where is it? It's next to the bookstore. There's a bakery across from the cafe. Okay. Where is the woman now? A woman is waiting for a man. Where is the woman now? Hey, really sorry, but it looks like I'll be 30 minutes late. Okay, I'll wait for you at the cafe. Cafe? Where is it?
It's next to the bookstore. There's a bakery across from the cafe. Okay. A man and a woman are talking about summer vacation. What is the woman going to do on her summer vacation? Have you already planned for the summer vacation? Not yet. I'm thinking about going to the sea or the mountains. I'm going to the beach with some friends. We're going surfing. Sounds nice. Why don't you come with us? Wow, sure. Thanks. What is the woman going to do on her summer vacation? A man and a woman are talking about summer vacation. What is the woman going to do on her summer vacation? Have you already planned for the summer vacation? Not yet. I'm thinking about going to the sea or the mountains. I'm going to the beach with some friends. We're going surfing. Sounds nice. Why don't you come with us? Wow, sure. Thanks. A man and a woman are talking. What did the woman eat this morning? Oh, I'm hungry. Did you eat anything for breakfast? Yes, I did, but only a little. What did you eat? I had yogurt and coffee. That's not enough. You'll need some bread and fruit, too. What did the woman eat this morning? A man and a woman are talking. What did the woman eat this morning? Oh, I'm hungry. Did you eat anything for breakfast? Yes, I did, but only a little. What did you eat? I had yogurt and coffee. That's not enough. You'll need some bread and fruit, too. Did you, get it? Did you forget our study date at 10 this morning? I'm sorry, Naomi. At 10, I was talking with my professor and couldn't get away. I'm sorry. I should have called. That's okay. So, how did the meeting go with the professor? It went fine. He gave me an extension on my paper, and I can still take the midterm. How was your study group yesterday? Well, we were studying together during lunch when I noticed an old friend of mine from high school in the same cafe. My concentration quickly switched from class to catching up with my friend, so I didn't get much done. You've taken that class before, right? Yeah, last semester. I was always asking questions in that class because it was so difficult. Well, I was hoping that you could lend me a hand with my paper. I can't think of anything else to write. Sure, no problem. That is, if you can help me study for our history test. Sounds like a deal. Hi, everyone. I'm Gabriella. How are your English listening skills? In this video, you'll have a chance to test them out with a quiz. First, you'll see an image and hear a question. Next comes a short dialogue. Listen carefully and see if you can answer correctly. We'll show you the answer at the end. Are you ready? A woman is in a department store. Which floor is she going to? Excuse me, where are the children's clothes? They're on the fifth and sixth floors. Do you also have baby clothes? Yes, they're on the sixth floor. We have a lot there. Thank you very much. I'll go and have a look there. Which floor is she going to? A woman is in a department store. Which floor is she going to? Excuse me, where are the children's clothes? They're on the fifth and sixth floors. Do you also have baby clothes? Yes, they're on the sixth floor. We have a lot there. Thank you very much. I'll go and have a look there. A woman is asking a store clerk something at a bookstore. Which book does the woman want to see? Excuse me, I'd like to take a look at a book on that shelf. 
Which book would you like? The one about cars. One moment, please. This one? Yep,、yeah, that's right. Here you go. Which book does the woman want to see? A woman is asking a store clerk something at a bookstore. Which book does the woman want to see? Excuse me, I'd like to take a look at a book on that shelf. Which book would you like? The one about cars. One moment, please. This one? Yep,、yeah, that's right. Here you go. A man and a woman are looking over a menu at a restaurant. What's the man going to order? What are you going to order? The pizza looks delicious. I think I'll go with that. I had pizza yesterday, so. Okay then, what about the hamburger? Sounds good. I'll go with that. What's the man going to order? A man and a woman are looking over a menu at a restaurant. What's the man going to order? What are you going to order? The pizza looks delicious. I think I'll go with that. I had pizza yesterday, so. Okay then, what about the hamburger? Sounds good. I'll go with that. A man is calling the doctor's office. What time does he need to be at the doctor's office by? Hello, how can I help you? What time do you close today? We close at 6 o'clock, but please come in before 5 30. Okay, thank you. What time does he need to be at the doctor's office by? A man is calling the doctor's office. What time does he need to be at the doctor's office by? Hello, how can I help you? What time do you close today? We close at 6 o'clock, but please come in before 5 30. Okay, thank you. Did you get Ma'am, may I have your first and last names? Melissa West. Thank you, ma'am. I have found your reservation. Here's the registration information. Does everything look correct to you? Yes, it seems to be correct. Excellent. Now, I will just need a photo ID for legal purposes. Will my passport do? That would be just fine, ma'am. Checkout is between noon and two o'clock. You may request an extension of up to five hours free of charge. What if I need more time? Then a late charge of 5% will be added to your bill. How are your English listening skills? First, you'll see an image and hear a question. Next comes a short dialogue. Listen carefully and see if you can answer correctly. We'll show you the answer at the end. A boy is reading from his journal. What was the first thing the boy did today? The weather was great today. I went swimming this afternoon at the pool. And I went to a movie in the evening. I also studied all morning. Today wasn't bad. What was the first thing the boy did today? A boy is reading from his journal. What was the first thing the boy did today? The weather was great today. I went swimming this afternoon at the pool. And I went to a movie in the evening. I also studied all morning. Today wasn't bad. A woman and a man are looking at a photograph. Which photo are they looking at? This is a photo of the soccer team your son is on, isn't it? Which one is your son? This one. Oh, he's the tallest one. Yep, he's even taller than the coach. Which photo are they looking at? A woman and a man are looking at a photograph. Which photo are they looking at? 
This is a photo of the soccer team your son is on, isn't it? Which one is your son? This one. Oh, he's the tallest one. Yep, he's even taller than the coach. A man and a woman are talking. When are they going to see the movie? Why don't we go see a movie on Saturday? Yes, I'd love to, but I have to work a shift in the morning. What time will you finish? I'll finish at two o'clock. Then let's meet up at the cafe at three o'clock and see a movie at four o'clock. Okay. When are they going to see the movie? A man and a woman are talking. When are they going to see the movie? Why don't we go see a movie on Saturday? Yes, I'd love to, but I have to work a shift in the morning. What time will you finish? I'll finish at two o'clock. Then let's meet up at the cafe at three o'clock and see a movie at four o'clock. Okay. Hi, everybody. My name is Alicia, and today I'm going to talk about the correct use of the word only. Let's take a look at a few examples and see how moving the word only around in a sentence can change the meaning of the sentence. All right, let's begin. First, I want to define the word only and how I'm going to use it for this lesson. The word only for this lesson, uh, we're going to look at it as an adverb. So an adverb, which means a single case or a single instance of something. So there's nothing uh, different, uh, nothing more, nothing less. There's just this one thing, this one case of something. Um, but I want to focus for this lesson on the importance of the position of only in a sentence. Um, so one key to keep in mind when you use the word only, and this is a point for native speakers and for non-native speakers, uh, we need to place the word only as close as possible to the word or to the phrase that it modifies. And by modifies, I mean only is connected to that phrase, only is changing that phrase in some way. And when I say places, uh, place it as close as possible to that word, I mean before that word. It needs to come before the word it's changing, before the word it's modifying. So I want to show um, a few examples of how to do this, um, but I'm going to move the word only around in the same sentence. So let's take a look. I'll show you what I mean. Let's take a look at this, this sentence. Uh, the base sentence here is Sarah saw Michael at the park. A simple sentence. So there are two people involved, one action, uh, in this case the past tense saw, and then a location at the park. But I'm going to use the word only here in a few different positions to show how much it can change the meaning of the sentence depending on where we place it. So the first example here I have is only Sarah saw Michael at the park. Here the word only comes before Sarah, so that means that these two words are connected. Only is modifying Sarah in this case. This sentence therefore means that Sarah, perhaps in a group of people or with somebody else, Sarah was the only person, the single person, who saw Michael at the park. Maybe there were other people in the group she was with, but she was the single person, the only person who saw Michael. So only Sarah saw Michael at the park. That's the meaning with the placement of only before Sarah here. Let's look at the next sentence. Sarah only saw Michael at the park. So here, only is coming before the word saw. So in this case, it's modifying this verb, saw. This sentence, therefore, means that Sarah, the only thing Sarah did, her only action, was to see. She only saw Michael at the park, meaning no other actions happened. Sarah did not wave to Michael. Sarah did not greet Michael. Sarah did not throw something at Michael. Uh, whatever. There was no other action. The only action, the single action, the sole action, was uh, that she saw Michael. Sarah only saw Michael at the park. So the placement before the verb gives us this meaning. Let's look at one more example. Sarah saw only Michael at the park. Here, only comes before Michael in this case. Um, so the connection, the modification is happening here. Sarah saw only Michael at the park means she did not see any other people at the park. So this could mean uh, that there were no other people at the park or um, that maybe 
she just she just didn't see anybody at the park so this sentence is a little bit tricky it's a little hard to understand exactly what the writer wants to say but it could mean um, that there were um, perhaps no people at the park no other people at the park that Sarah saw so she went to the park she saw only Michael there was only one person a single person it was Michael that Sarah saw so placing only before in this case Michael gives us this meaning all right one more sentence Sarah saw Michael only at the park so here the word only is coming before this phrase at the park this location in this case meaning there was a single place where Sarah saw Michael. So Sarah did not see Michael at the supermarket. She did not see him at the store. She did not see him at school. She saw him only at the park. So there's a single location where she saw Michael. So these four sentences show us how much the meaning of a sentence can change depending on our placement of the of the word only. So it's important to keep in mind. Another thing that I've done throughout this lesson a little bit is I've emphasized with my voice um, the word that only is modifying. But I want to make one more point here. In speech, when actually speaking, we can stress words for emphasis and for clarity to make it very clear which word in the sentence we want to emphasize, which word we want only to modify. So for example, I can say only Sarah saw Michael at the park or Sarah only saw Michael at the park. So with your voice, you have the ability to emphasize certain words and certain phrases in the sentences. However, uh, in, in writing, it's not possible to do this, so correct placement of the word only is quite important. So I wanted to give you a few examples, uh, and it's just something to think about the next time you use the word only. So make sure um, that you're placing the word only as close as possible to the word that it modifies. So just something to keep in mind. All right, so that's it for this lesson. If you have any questions or comments, please feel free to let us know in the comment section below this video. If you like the video, give it a thumbs up, subscribe to the channel, and check us out at EnglishClass101.com for some other resources. Thanks very much for watching this lesson, and I'll see you again soon. Bye-bye. Hi, everybody. My name is Alicia. Today, I'm going to talk about how to use the word almost. I'm going to show a few different example sentences and give you a couple pointers, some things to watch out for when you're using this word. So first, let's look at uh, the meaning of the word almost. So almost is an adverb. Uh, it's a word that means nearly or not quite or not completely. It can also mean similar to something, but not exactly like something. Um, so I've got a lot of example sentences here that I hope to uh, talk about to kind of explain um, the use of almost. Before I do that, though, I want to mention um, this point over here. Almost comes before the word it modifies. So modifies means like almost is attached. You can think of it as being attached to another word and almost changes the meaning of that word. So um, using almost before another word or before another phrase adds this meaning of nearly or not quite or not completely to that word or to that phrase. So let's begin with that and look at a few examples. I almost forgot my homework. So here almost comes before the verb forgot in this case, meaning I nearly forgot my homework. So um, the word almost, like I said, almost should come before the word it modifies. So here it's modifying the word forgot. So I nearly forgot my homework. I was very close to forgetting my homework. Another example, he almost always calls on his way home. So here it comes before the word, uh, it, it comes before the word always in this case. Almost always, meaning maybe like 95% of the time or 90% of the time. So not always, but nearly, very nearly always calls on his way home is the meaning of this sentence. Okay, let's look at another one, maybe uh, an opposite meaning here. They almost never leave the house. So here we've, we've got never as the word that almost is modifying. So almost never means you can think of it in terms of a percentage, for example, like 5% of the time they leave the house. Very, very close to zero, but not quite zero. So almost never, not quite never, but very near to never. Uh, the next one, you're almost finished. You're almost finished. So here, almost is modifying the word finished. So uh, in other words, you're nearly finished in this case. Maybe you're nearly finished with your job for the day or you're nearly finished with uh, your homework, for example. You're almost finished is the meaning here. 
Let's look at the next sentence then. So the next sentence is we're almost home. We're almost home. In this case, almost is modifying the word home. Home, in this case, means uh, at your place of residence. So to be in a status, in a status of being at your, at your place, at your dwelling, at your residence. So to be almost home means nearly at your house, in other words. So uh, we can modify in this way. Uh, similar to this negative uh, I used up here with never, we've got there's almost nothing left in the refrigerator. So again, almost nothing in this case. So very nearly no things, very nearly maybe nothing to eat or no food in the refrigerator. So this sentence means there's something in the refrigerator, a few things maybe, but almost nothing. So very little of something. Okay, the next sentence um, shows another point that I want to make about the placement of the word almost. I mentioned uh, in these initial example sentences that the word almost comes before the word it modifies, as we've seen so far. However, when you're using the verb to be and the variations of it, like was and were, for example, um, almost comes after that verb. So let's look at an example of that. Here we have, uh, here, here I have, uh, he was almost fired from his job. So here's my to be verb, in this case using was. He was almost fired from his job. So here, almost follows the verb to be. This is a slight change. I'll show you one more example sentence later. So again, let's go back to this first pattern. Uh, almost no one came to her party. So here, almost begins the sentence. It's modifying the word no one. Almost no one came to her party. So meaning very few people came to her party. Lastly, let's look at one more to be example. Here, I was almost late for the movie. So again, here's our to be verb, I was, and almost follows that to be verb. I was almost late for the movie. Okay, so these are uh, quite a few examples of how we can use almost. I wanna talk a little bit about some other ways to use almost. We use almost with time and quantity expressions. So um, in these cases, we use the word almost before the time or before the quantity. Let's look at some examples. For example, we've been waiting almost two hours. So here, two hours um, is a length of time. We use almost before that, so nearly two hours. Not quite two hours, but nearly two hours. The next example, I've lived here for almost five years. So that doesn't mean five years exactly, but very nearly five years. Same thing here. He said they were almost, I'm sorry, he said there were almost 5,000 people. So almost 5,000, not quite, maybe like 4,900, for example. Very nearly 5,000. Again, the recipe made almost 200 cookies. So again, not quite is the meaning here. So all of these kind of, um, we use this when it may be, it's easier to round up to use like the next easily recognizable number. Like it might sound strange in the last example to say the recipe made 498 cookies. It sounds very, very specific. And it also sounds like maybe the speaker counted each individual cookie. So sometimes that's really not reasonable or it might just sound a little bit strange. So, um, or also it's just sometimes not possible to count exactly how many people or how many of some Something, we're in a situation, but using almost, we can make a guess sometimes. So this is quite a, a useful thing for time and quantity expressions. Okay, so as we've seen so far in this lesson, um, we can use always with words like always and never. I used it over here, for example, he almost always and they almost never. So just keep in mind that these have very, very different meanings, kind of opposite meanings. So. Uh, I almost always means very nearly always, and almost never means very nearly never, but not quite. Same thing with um, all or nothing or no. So I used an example here. There's almost nothing, for example. Um, so here, it means very close to zero. If I used almost all, like almost all the people were happy, it means very nearly everybody as well. So you can kind of see a pattern here, and the same one um, is we can see here at the end, everyone and no one. It's like extreme, so um, like 100% versus 0% of something. So all or nothing, everyone or no one. Um, we can use almost to show that we are very near to these levels, but not quite at these levels. 
The last thing I want to mention in this lesson is a word of caution. Uh, just be careful about where you place almost in a sentence because it can really affect the meaning of the sentence. So here, let's look at two very similar sentences. One, he almost told his boss all the secrets. And two, he told his boss almost all the secrets. These are very different sentences, but they seem very similar. Here, I've used almost before the verb told. So almost is modifying the word told here. He almost told his boss all the secrets, meaning he very nearly told his boss all the secrets, but he did not. He did not. So here, almost modifies this verb told, meaning the action itself. He almost did this action, but he did not do the action. In this sentence, however, he told his boss almost all the secrets. Almost, because of its positioning, is modifying the word all. He told his boss almost all the secrets, meaning he told his boss very nearly everything, all of the secrets. So maybe like 95%, 90 to 95% of the secrets he told his boss. So the action happened. He did tell his boss, but he didn't tell everything in this case. So please keep this in mind. Your placement, the place in the sentence where you use the word almost can create very, very different meanings. So remember this point here, almost should come before the word it modifies. So when you're writing and when you're speaking, you should think carefully about this. Also remember when you're using the verb to be, almost should come after that verb. Um, finally, when you're speaking, as I am right now, we do have the ability to use our voices. We can emphasize key words. Uh, we can stress them with our voices to make it clear which word we want to emphasize. However, we can't really do that in writing. So it's really important to consider, to think about where we place the word almost when we're writing. So I hope that this lesson was useful for you. If you have any questions or any comments, please feel free to let us know in the comment section below this video. If you liked the video, give us a thumbs up, subscribe to the channel, and check us out at EnglishClass101.com. Thanks very much for watching this lesson, and I will see you again soon. Bye-bye. Hi everybody, my name is Alicia. Today I'm going to talk about the difference between which and that. Which and that are both relative pronouns, uh, but a lot of people confuse the two. So let's talk about how to use them. Okay, first, uh, a quick overview. Which, first, we use which in what are called non-restrictive relative clauses. Uh, we use that, on the other hand, in restrictive relative clauses. So before we continue, let's talk about the difference between non-restrictive clauses and restrictive clauses. The difference here, a non-restrictive clause, first of all, where we use which, is a clause that does not have information essential to understanding the noun it is connected to. I'll show you some examples in just a minute. A restrictive clause, however, is a clause that has information essential to our understanding of that noun. So we need the information in the restrictive clause to completely understand the noun or the noun phrase it is attached to. A non-restrictive clause is sort of extra information. We don't need the information to understand the noun or the noun phrase. It just provides some more information. So let's take a look at a few examples of this. The first example I have is rather extreme, uh, but it's just to show the differences between these two. First, the school that I parked my car next to is dangerous. So here my noun is school. Here I've got the relative pronoun that. I have the school that I parked my car next to is dangerous. I've used that here because my clause is a restrictive clause. I need this information. The school that I parked my car next to is dangerous. If I remove this, the school is dangerous, the sentence is correct. However, the meaning changes. Uh, the key here is that I parked my car there, so I want to explain that specifically the school that I parked my car next to, this school in particular, is dangerous. So that shows us that it's a restrictive clause. We have to use that in this sentence because the information is essential to our understanding. In this sentence, however, the school, which has a tennis court, is dangerous. I've used which. So which is a non-restrictive, is used in non-restrictive clauses. 
This shows us it is extra information. The school has a tennis court. Do I need to know this information? No, it's just extra information. If I remove this clause, the school is dangerous. The root sentence, the basic sentence, stays the same. This is just extra information. It doesn't necessarily tell us uh, essential information about the situation. So we use which to show that. It's a non-restrictive relative clause. As I said, this is a rather extreme example. Um, so let's take a look at something that's a little bit more uh, complex. Okay. Let's look at the next two sentences. First, the car, which I bought last year, is already having trouble. And the car that I bought last year is already having trouble. These are very similar sounding sentences. However, our choice of which or that, as well as the commas, which I'll talk about later, have changed the meaning. So there are a couple key differences here. One, by seeing that uh, in the first sentence that we're using a non-restrictive clause here with which, we see uh, the car which I bought last year. This shows us that this is extra information about the car. Here, however, we see that this is essential information. The car that I bought last year is already having trouble. So the speaker could be saying here with this sentence, the second sentence, the car that I bought last year, specifically a car that the speaker purchased the previous year. This sentence means, therefore, the speaker might have other cars. The speaker is specifically meaning this specific car that they, he or she bought last year. In this sentence, with the non-restrictive clause, we don't have the same nuance. The car, which I bought last year, is just extra information in this sentence. So here, the car that I bought last year, this is indicating a specific car. This one, with the non-restrictive clause, it's just giving us extra information. So the speaker may or may not have another car. Um, we don't know. So that's all I want to say about that. Okay. But a question that many people have is how do you know whether it's a restrictive or a non-restrictive clause? So this is a quick tip, a quick hint uh, for native speakers and non-native speakers, actually. Is it restrictive, non-restrictive? How do I know? To do that, remove the clause. Just take the clause out of the sentence. Is the meaning of the sentence the same? Is the sentence still grammatically correct? Is it okay? If yes, if the sentence is okay, the meaning is the same, it's a non-restrictive clause. If no, if the meaning changes, if you lose some key information, it is a restrictive clause. So this is a quick hint. If you're not sure whether to use which or whether to use that, try this test, this quick test. Just take it out and see if the meaning changes. The last thing I want to talk about here is the use of commas. So you'll notice I used commas uh, throughout this lesson and also when I was reading, they kind of create a natural pause around this extra information. But when do you use them? We should use commas around non-restrictive clauses. So you can see I used them here and here in the example sentences. We use commas around non-restrictive clauses only. Again, this lesson, comma, which is being recorded, comma, is about which and that. So when you're reading, it creates a natural pause. So the reader knows there's going to be like uh, extra information there. The reader can understand through use of these commas. However, do not use commas around restrictive clauses. For example, the lesson that I just taught was about how to use which and that. This is a restrictive clause. So I mean specifically this lesson that I just taught was about how to use which and that. I should not include commas here because I'm not including any extra information. All of the information is essential. It's the same with all of the other example sentences I used in this lesson. There are no commas included because all of the information is essential. The reader needs to understand everything in one piece. You can think of it that way. Okay. So that's an overview of the differences between which and that, uh, restrictive clauses as well, and uh, a couple of comma tips too. So I hope that this was a useful lesson for you. If you have any questions, of course, please feel free to let us know in the comments. If you like the video, give us a thumbs up, subscribe to the channel if you haven't already, and check us out for more good stuff at EnglishClass101.com. Thanks very much for watching, and I will see you again soon. Bye-bye. 10 ways to report speech. Let's go. Say. The first word is say. Say as a verb. Say is a very neutral word you can use to report 
someone's speech to explain something someone said in the past. So, for example, he said the barbecue was canceled. Mm, just a simple, neutral report. Tell. The next verb is tell. Tell is used when one person is giving information to another, to tell someone something they did not know before. Don't say, tell me your phone number, that's weird. But like, uh, can you tell me where the station is? Can you tell me where to buy a hamburger? Can you tell me where to pick up my new car? Like, so giving someone information they don't know or, or on the other hand, explaining something one way to another person. So don't tell me what I can't do is a very good Lost reference if you've ever watched Lost. Uh, so tell. Another example sentence, my boss told me I was doing a good job. Speak. Uh, the next one is speak, speak. So we use speak when we're talking about uh, language ability, like I speak English, I speak Japanese. We can use speak in the past tense to report something, but it usually sounds a little more formal. So like I spoke to my boss about, or I spoke to my parents about, or I spoke to my boyfriend or girlfriend about, blah, blah, blah. That using speak instead of talked, uh, it makes it sound a little bit more formal. So you can use speak, but it's going to sound polite. In a sentence, my colleague spoke with me about an upcoming project. Was like... Okay, the next one, uh, the next two actually, are very, very casual expressions. So when you're speaking with friends and you're kind of talking about a quick, maybe somewhat emotional conversation, you will hear native speakers, especially Americans, perhaps this is unique somewhat, to Americans, use the phrase was like. I was like, he was like, she was like. This is a very casual way to report speech. And you'll hear it often, very, very quickly together. Uh, so someone will say, I was like, what? And then she was like, no. And then I was like, yeah. That's the kind of pattern you'll hear it in. Very, very quick ways to report speech, but the subject changes. I was like, he was like, she was like, we were like. This is a way to share what happens quickly. Instead of I said, he said, she said, which might sound a little too formal, we can use I was like, he was like to do that instead. So this is a really fun one. And if you can use this uh, naturally, I think that it'll really help you sound more natural too. So in a sentence, and then he was like, I love that movie, was all. The next one is also uh, similar to was like, we have the expression was all. So was all, uh, don't worry about all. All does not have the meaning of the whole of something or a complete something. Instead, was all, this set phrase, is used to report speech. Usually this one is used when there's some kind of emotional, uh, emotional aspect to your conversation or it's a little dramatic or maybe a little exciting. We use it the same way as was like in that very, very quick style of speaking. And then he was like, and I was all, and then she was like, and I was all. We use those together, but I was all has a little more emphasis. I feel I tend to use it when, my, when I want to express a stronger emotion. And I was all, no way, or and I was all, what? So <laughs> you can use it for those very like surprised emotions or maybe angry emotions was like and was all are both used in very casual situations. So, in a sentence, and I was all, oh my god, me too. Talk. The next word is talk. So, talk, similar to uh, say, is a fairly neutral verb when reporting speech. You'll use it in a situation where someone is giving new information uh, to you, uh, but maybe it's a two-way conversation. So, for example, we talked about blah, blah, blah uh, for a topic, or uh, my boss talked to me about blah, blah, blah. So maybe new information is being exchanged, but the conversation is two-way. There are multiple participants. With tell, it's like the nuance is sort of one person is reporting information, giving information, with talked, it's, there's an exchange happening there. So keep in mind when you use the word talk, you will say either I, I talked to or I talked with someone. 
uh, and then you'll usually have a topic. So I talked to my friend about blah, blah, blah. Uh, I talked to my friend about my new apartment. I talked to my boss about a raise. I talked to my boss, no, I talked to my dog about what dogs do. <laughs> so it, there's some kind of, there's some kind of exchange happening there. You'll need to use to or with uh, when you're referring to the person or entity you're talking to. And you'll use about to refer to the subject. So uh, you can use this one, um, yeah, when, you're, when you want to discuss exchanges of information. So in a sentence, she talked to me about my family. Mention. Let's go to the next one. The next one is mention. Mention is used when like something is just, there's just one small point in a conversation, like just a little side note or, Maybe it's not the focus of a conversation, but just something someone says quickly, or there's just a little thing that you hear. Oh, you mentioned something about blah, 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 or you mentioned that a new project, like it's, it's maybe not the focus of the conversation, but something that you heard a little bit about. That's, that's when we use the verb mention. We can also use it in a statement, like please uh, mention any skills you have on a resume. So it, the nuance is sort of like a, like just a little bit of information uh, is when we use mention. So in a sentence, our manager mentioned upcoming changes at the company. To go on and on. Okay, the next expression is to go on and on. So to go on and on means just to talk for a very long time. So maybe you have a coworker or a friend or a family member that just talks and does not stop talking. Uh, we say to go on and on. That's the expression we use. So in a sentence, the speaker at the seminar was going on and on about the topic. If you really want to emphasize it, you can say it was going on and on and on and on and on. That really emphasizes that the person continues to speak. So if you know somebody, um, who does that a lot, you can use this expression to talk about them. According to. Uh, the next expression here is according to. According to is used uh, actually in the news or like to officially report something. So according to sources or according to the police, according to the government official, according to my teacher, according to my mother, these are like direct reports of information and they're direct reports of information from a specific source. So according to the newspaper, my f neighborhood has 50,000 amazing ramen shops. That's not true. <laughs> but if I want to, instead of just saying my neighborhood has 50,000 amazing ramen shops, I'm giving a source for that. So according to my newspaper, this is, th this is where I got the information. So this is important to use in news and newspapers and any kind of official documentation you will see and hear according to in these cases. Ah, in a sentence, according to a witness at the scene, the suspect escaped. Report. Great, so um, the next one is report. So report, similar to according to, we use report in more official situations. So to officially share information, like to report to the police, to report to your teacher, to report to uh, your boss. Sometimes it means to submit documentation, like to, to give someone a written report. Sometimes it's to share information officially, just, just with your voice, to report news or to report an update. Uh, so when you want to give, an, give official information, we'll use the verb report. So in a sentence, sources in the area report that the accident was not serious. Thank goodness. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Top 10 must know phrases for the restaurant. Let's get started. A table for three, please. A table for three, please. You tell them the number of people that you are total so that the host can bring you to an appropriate table. A table for two, please. A table for five, please? Could I please see a menu? Could I please see a menu? Usually menus are given to you as soon as you sit down at your table. But if that's not the case and you need to ask, this is a polite way to do it. Could I please see a menu? I'd like to try this dish. I'd like to try this dish. When looking at a menu, hopefully you'll find something you want to eat. I'd like to try this dish. Could you leave out the onions? 
Could you leave out the onions? If there's an ingredient in the dish that you're ordering that you don't want, you can always ask the waiter if it could be prepared without that ingredient. So for example, I might say, could I get the burger but with no cheese? Could you pass the salt? Could you pass the salt? When you're at a restaurant, especially if you're at a big table with a lot of people, you might not always be able to reach things. So you would ask, could you pass me the salt? Could you pass me the ketchup? Could you pass me another napkin? Waiter, waiter. A waiter is someone who takes your order and brings you food. In America and in many other Western countries, it's more polite to call a waiter to your table by simply saying, excuse me? Or if you see another waiter walking by, but it's not your waiter, you can always say, excuse me, if you see our waiter, could you please let them know to come to our table? Is there any dairy in this dish? Is there any dairy in this dish? This is something you would say if you have a dairy allergy, a dairy intolerance, or you just don't like dairy. You're asking the waiter about the ingredients in a particular dish. I do this all the time. Is there any cheese in this? No? Okay. And if there is an ingredient that you don't want, for example, onions, you could say, are there any onions in this? And the waiter might say yes. And if you don't want it, you could always request, could you leave out the onions? Could you prepare it without the onions, please? Can we get separate checks? Can we get separate checks? This is actually something that's very common, especially in America. If you might go out with a group of friends, or even if you're on a date, sometimes you might want to get separate checks, pay for your own things. That way, you can all pay separately just for what you yourself ordered, and you won't have to worry about owing each other money or calculating off a big, huge bill. Are there any specials today? Are there any specials today? A special at a restaurant is a dish that isn't usually on the menu. It's something that's special, but it's a special that the chef is offering that day or that week or that month. So sometimes if you don't see what the specials are, you'd ask your waiter, excuse me, are there any specials today? Could we have the bill, please? Could we have the bill, please? This is how you request that the check or the bill comes to your table. Could we get the check, please? Could we get the bill, please? You're asking this to your waiter, who will then bring you the check and you can pay. About 10 words that you can use at a bar. Let's go. To buy a round. The first expression is to buy a round. To buy a round means uh, to buy a round of drinks, essentially. A round of drinks means one drink for everyone in your group, one drink for everyone in your party. By the way, the word party is used to mean group at a bar or restaurant. The number of people in your party is the number of people in your group. So to buy a round means to buy a drink for everybody. In a sentence, our boss began the party by buying everyone a round. In a different sentence, you're buying the next round. On the rocks. The next expression is on the rocks. On the rocks is a way to order a drink. When you say on the rocks, it means your drink on ice only. So rocks are the ice in your glass. So you can imagine the ice, the pieces of ice in your glass, the ice cubes or an ice ball, these are like rocks. So saying I'd like uh, whiskey, for example, on the rocks means just whiskey. Uh, served over ice. That's what on the rocks mean. So in a sentence, I'd like a gin on the rocks. Straight up. The next expression is straight up. So a straight up drink is different from an on the rocks drink. A straight up drink is chilled uh, with ice, but it's strained. So there's no ice in the drink, but it is. it has been chilled with ice. So a straight up drink, there's nothing else in the glass, but it is a chilled drink. In a sentence, uh, I'd like a martini straight up. Some people use the word straight or straight up, but they mean neat, which is the next word we're going to talk about. So keep in mind straight or straight up means chilled. Uh, that's one of the key points here. So yeah, a martini straight up is a chilled martini. Neat. So the next expression is neat. Uh, to order a drink neat means the drink is not chilled and there is no ice. It's just it's just the, the alcohol, it's just the liquor. There's nothing special about it. A neat drink is only the drink. That's it, nothing happens to it. So in a sentence, I'd like a whiskey neat. Pint, half pint. 
The next expression is really two expressions. These are words you use when you order beer. They are pint and half pint. Depending on the country that you live in, pint can be a different size. They vary uh, by a, f like a few milliliters depending on the country where you live in. A half pint then is roughly half of the pint size. So a half pint and a pint uh, are two ways, two sizes we use to order beer. In a sentence, can I have a half pint of this stout? Chaser. The next expression is chaser. So a chaser is something you use to follow an alcoholic drink. Chasers are often used after shots. So shots are small drinks that are usually kind of strong in alcohol content and they have a very strong taste. So some people like to have something after that. Uh, they call it a chaser. So the image is that the, the second drink is chasing the first drink into your body. You can think of it that way. The chaser is a non-alcoholic drink. So it could be water, it could be soda, it could be something like that, juice maybe. Mm. So chaser. In a sentence, shots of tequila are often followed with chasers. To be tipsy. The next word is to be tipsy. To be tipsy is a way to describe your feeling when you're drinking. So if you can imagine when you're, uh, when you're standing straight up, uh, when you're standing as regular, you're very like confident and tall and you don't move very much. But if you feel tipsy, this comes from the verb to tip like this. So something tips uh, to one side or another. Uh, think of your body in this way. So we use the word uh, tipsy, the adjective tipsy, um, to describe this feeling. Maybe you're not so steady on your feet. You could tip over ah! at any time. That's called being tipsy from alcohol. Okay. So, in a sentence, uh, let's see, I'm a little tipsy, I need some water. To be drunk. The next expression is to be drunk. So, we talked about the word tipsy. So, tipsy is a little bit, like, a little unsteady, but drunk is just a mess. <laughs> you're, just, you're just a disaster. Maybe you're being noisy, you're being loud, it's difficult to control your body or your friend's body, whatever. So drunk is usually seen as a negative thing. Um, so yeah, so drunk uh, expresses, yeah, it's, it's just not pretty <laughs> sometimes. So in a sentence, your friend is drunk, let's take him home. To call it a night. The next expression is to call it a night. To call it a night means to decide to finish at the bar, to go home. Uh, you're ready to be done. So uh, here I'm going to call it. I'm going to say this is tonight. Tonight is finished. Mm. So in a sentence, uh, it's been a long evening. I'm going to call it a night. I mean, I'm going to go home. I'm done. Mm. It's a casual expression. Hangover. And then one more that you can use maybe the day after you visit a bar is hangover. So a hangover is a noun. Hangover is uh, the word we use to describe the feelings after drinking too much. So maybe you feel sick to your stomach, you have a headache, your body is sore. There are a number of different feelings uh, you might have when you feel hungover. Uh, to be hungover uh, is another way to say it. But when you have a hangover, it usually doesn't feel very good. In a sentence, I have a hangover today. I'm not going drinking tonight. About the top 25 English phrases, so let's get started. The first phrase is hello. Hello, of course, is used as a greeting. You can greet your friends, you can greet your coworkers, your family with this phrase just by saying hello. Hey, hi, what's up? Hello. Sup? Yo. Pretty much any time of day you can use hello. Hello? The next phrase is good morning. Good morning is used as a greeting in the morning. You can kind of feel when morning ends for you. Good morning is nice and polite. Or even just morning with your close friends or close coworkers. The next phrase is good night. Good night is fine. We don't use this to greet other people. We use it when we're saying goodbye to other people at night. Uh, family members, particularly mothers and fathers, to say good night to their children before they put them to bed. You can say it to your friend in a text message or in an email if you've been talking for a while. Good night. So the next word to talk about is goodbye. Uh, use it when you say goodbye to your friends, when you leave your friends. Goodbye. Bye, of course. Take care. Have a nice day. Peace out. That's another way to say goodbye. Okay, the next phrase is I'm plus your name. Of course, this is a way to introduce yourself. You can use I'm, in my case, Alicia. I'm Alicia to introduce yourself in any situation. New friend, I'm Alicia. Okay, the next phrase is what's your name? What's your name is used to ask someone else what their name is. So, what is your name sounds a bit 
Try to use, what's your name? If you forget someone's name, you can say, sorry, what's your name? Or sorry, what's your name again? Next phrase is, nice to meet you. Nice to meet you, anytime you meet someone new. Nice to meet you is fine. Good to meet you is a little more casual. Great to meet you sounds very excited. Pleasure to meet you sounds like uh, maybe a formal situation or a business context. Okay, the next phrase is, how are you? How are you? Is an, It's just a friendly way to check in with the other person. You can use it with friends, your family, your coworkers, maybe even your boss to a certain degree. Uh, how are ya? How you doing? The next phrase is, I'm fine, thanks, and you? Uh, if you saw English in three minutes, we talked a lot about this phrase. Uh, instead of, I'm fine, thank you, and you, say, I'm good, thanks, how are you? Just shorten it, make it a little bit more natural. How are you? Good. How are you? Great. How are you? Not so good. How are you? Okay. And so on. So when someone says, how are you? Offer, I usually say, I'm good. This week, I blah, blah, blah. Give some information about what you've been up to. Maybe a hobby, something that you did recently, an event, something interesting you saw, whatever. People want to make that connection with you and it's a good chance for you to continue speaking. The next word is please. Please is a polite phrase used when you want something from someone else. You can use this as a response when someone offers you something, like in a restaurant, for example. Would you like more water? Would you like something to drink? Oh, please. The next phrase is thank you. Thank you is used to express your appreciation you can use thank you with everybody. The next phrase is you're welcome, you're welcome. When someone says thank you, you can say you're welcome. Ah, no biggie, I use no biggie as in no biggie is short for no big problem. The next word is yes. Yes, of course, yes means is any positive expression. Someone asks you a question and the answer is a positive answer. You say yes, yep, uh-huh, yeah. We. Oui. <laughs> no. Next, I'm guessing I know it. Yep. The next word is no. No is a negative response to something when you have to give a negative answer. So as you can probably guess, um, the long form of no is negative. I like to use nope. It's very, very casual. Not gonna happen. My parents would use that with me. To soften that a little bit, if you want to show a negative response to something, like let's go out for dinner tonight. What do you want to do? Like, do you want to go out? Mm, not really. Mm, no, I don't think so, mm, to soften it. The next word is okay, okay. This word comes from copy editors. Okay, when they had to check a manuscript, um, they had to label the manuscript all clear, A-C, but because they were copy editors and they have a very, very sick sense of humor, they thought they would mark it okay for all clear to make a joke because O and K do not start all and clear, but it caught on among everybody in the world. <laughs> anyway, okay uh, is used to agree with somebody else. Well, it can be used actually to express a positive or kind of a slight negative, I feel. Transitioning in your conversation, you can say, okay, now we're going to talk about blah, blah, blah. Okay, the next phrase is excuse me. Excuse me, it's used to get someone's attention in English when you don't know the other person. For example, in a store, a supermarket, maybe a stranger on the street, you need to ask directions. You can use excuse me. You can use excuse me in the supermarket. Excuse me, can you tell me where the hot sauce is? If you've done something rude in public, you can use excuse me. I personally do not do rude things in public ever. <laughs> I'm sorry is the next word we're gonna talk about. I'm sorry is used to apologize when you have made a mistake or someone you know has made a mistake and you're connected to it, or you just feel bad, you can use, I'm sorry. You made a mistake at work, I'm sorry. You forgot to feed your cat, I'm sorry. <laughs> sorry about that. You bump someone next to you, oh, sorry. What time is it is the next phrase when you need to check what time it is. What time is it? When you ask someone else what time it is, maybe you say this to yourself too. Check your watch, check your phone, check a clock. Pretty straightforward phrase. There aren't really any short versions, so. That's an easy one. <laughs> Where is the plus a location? So you can use this for um, a building or a store. We don't, we're not gonna use this where is the for a place, a city name or a state name or a country name. To do that, you would need to remove the. But where is the bank? Where is the post office? You can use this to ask directions, to ask for help in your house or at work. Where is the copy machine? Where is the file I need? Where is the blah, blah, blah? And where is the bathroom is perhaps a very important question to know. The next one is, may I use the restroom? May I use the restroom is a polite uh, and soft expression that you can use if you need to use the toilet, you need to use the washroom. And when you're at someone's house for the very first time, when you're in a place that you're that is new to you, you can 
and ask, may I use the restroom? More casually, can I go to the bathroom? To be very polite, you could say, may I go to the bathroom? The next phrase is, I would like to order something. You can use this at a restaurant, probably, or in any situation where you need to place an order. I'd like a pizza. I'd like a beer. Can I get the check, please? This will be used at a restaurant. When you've finished your meal and it's time to go, can I get the check, please? In a very, very casual situation, you can just say, check, please, that's fine. The next phrase is, see you soon. See you soon is used with friends and family members, perhaps, uh, when you expect to see them again soon after saying goodbye to them. This is used at the end of the conversation. You're going separate directions. You say, see you soon. See ya is also good, or just see you. To make it a little more formal, you can say, I'll see you again soon. Make a full sentence out of it that way. The next phrase is see you later. See you later is very similar to see you soon, but the point is with see you later is that you're probably going to meet that person again later on in the same day. The last phrase is really. Really is a very useful word because you can use it to show you're interested in a conversation with upward intonation. Really, really, tell me more. Or to show that you're not so interested in the conversation with downward intonation, really. So there are many other words that you can use similar to really in this way, like seriously or oh, oh, and so on. So it's a really good practice for your intonation. About ways to say hi, this should be fun. Let's get started. First is yo. <laughs> This one is a little bit casual, in case you couldn't tell. Used for close friends, maybe family members, if you have kind of a silly relationship with them. It's just quick, short, easy to do. In a sentence, yo, how's it going? Howdy. Howdy, uh, traditionally associated with cowboy culture, I suppose. You should play a banjo, maybe, or you've just gotten off a horse. I don't know. I use howdy from time to time. Howdy. 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 Dun, 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 dun. That was my banjo. <laughs> Yeah, in a sentence you might say, Howdy folks, welcome to the barbecue place. <laughs> Next is hey. Hey is a good friendly phrase. You can usually use hey with a wave and smile, look happy. If you don't, people might think that you're down in the dumps. People might think you're not in a very good mood. In a sentence, hey, uh, I heard you got uh, engaged last week. Congratulations. Something like that. It's usually kind of a cheery, happy expression. All right, next is what's up. Uh, what's up is the long form of sup. This does not literally mean what is above you right now. If you want to be funny, you can say the ceiling or the sky, but that joke gets old really fast and chances are the person you're talking to has already heard it before. It just means what are you up to? What is going on with you? In a sentence, what's up? Did you have a good weekend? Typical response to what's up is not much. Find out some more responses in English in three minutes. We did an episode on this. Nothing much. How about you? That's pretty good. Pretty good. Pretty good. Pretty good. <laughs> I don't know what I'm doing. Uh, the next one is long time no see. You can use this when you haven't seen the other person for a long time. You're at a party or an event or whatever. Anytime it's been a long break. You can decide how long long is. Not the day before or the week before. Maybe a few weeks or a month. Whatever's unusual for you and this other person. When you see them, you can say, hey, long time no see. How have you been? About 10 words for talking about beauty and skincare. So let's begin. All right. The first word is makeup. Makeup is all makeup. Everything we're going to talk about, almost everything we're going to talk about later is makeup. Makeup is usually used by women, but maybe men use makeup too. Makeup is uh, usually put on the face to change the appearance of the face in some way. So in a sentence, I use makeup almost every day or I wear makeup almost every day. Use and wear are both okay. The next word is eyeshadow. So eyeshadow is makeup which goes on top of the eye. So the eyelid, this part is called your eyelid. Eyeshadow goes here on top of the eyelid. So in a sentence, what kind of eyeshadow do you use? The next word is eyeliner, eyeliner. So eyeliner is used to draw a line, to draw lines near the eyes. That means it's safe to use near eyes. It depends on the person and their style, but maybe they use eyeliner to make lines in different ways uh, on, their, on their face, on, near, their, near their eyes. In a sentence, eyeliner is really difficult to put on. Okay. The next word is lipstick. Lipstick, uh, there's also lip gloss too. Uh, lipstick is kind of the traditional, just 
like a, a single color you apply it just on your lips and it gives I don't know not sometimes shiny sometimes a very neutral I don't know depends on the lipstick lip gloss gives lips like this very glossy almost like liquidy appearance so lipstick and lip gloss have different effects in a sentence uh, you have a lot of lipstick the next expression is foundation. Foundation is the makeup product. It is applied to the skin, usually of the face. So it's used to make the face seem like all one color, foundation. Maybe people apply it with, I don't know, like a spongy thing or with their hands or What's a brush. Called? There's like a, I forgot what it's called. Isn't it like a sponge? I don't know. Something. Is it a beauty blender? Is that a thing? I think so. I, I don't know. I don't know. I'm the wrong I person. Know. To... I don't know. Is a, beauty, is a beauty blender a thing? I'm not very good at the beauty stuff either. I don't know. Anyway, foundation is intended to make your skin color appear even. Foundation. So it's called foundation because it's like the base, the foundation for the rest of your makeup. So the foundation is the kind of the basis. So once your skin color is all correct and the same, then the other parts, we can fix the other parts. That's my theory anyway. In a sentence, there are a few different types of foundation. All right, the next expression is blush. Blush is usually applied on your cheeks and it's like a pink or red color. It gives the appearance of blushing. So when we feel embarrassed or maybe we feel excited, our cheeks might turn red. Uh, so blush is makeup, which creates that effect of blushing. This is usually a pink or red color to simulate, to make it look like you're blushing, even if you're not really. In a sentence, do you wear blush? The next expression is bronzer. Bronzer. So we talked about blush, which is supposed to give your skin the appearance of being pink or blushing. Bronzer gives skin the appearance of being more bronze or more tan. So you can apply this maybe in summer and it makes your skin look a little more tan, which you might like. Other people also may use bronzer to create shadows because it makes the skin a little bit darker in the places where it's applied. So there are a few different ways to use bronzer. In a sentence, bronzer is nice in summer. The next word is face wash, face wash. So this is a special soap that's for your face, specifically for the face. Maybe your face is very sensitive or you have some I don't know, trouble spots or I don't know. There's a specific wash you use for your face only. In a sentence, a good face wash is important for clear skin. Oh, the next word, oh, the, the dreaded, I have a couple words here that are maybe problems all of us deal with. The first kind of problem word on this list is acne. Acne is an uncountable noun. Acne refers to, usually this is, this a problem happens for like teenagers or people around that age, but adults can also have acne. Acne is like imperfections in the skin. Sometimes they're itchy or they're painful red bumps on your skin, or maybe they're not painful, but they're just blotches or a number of different ways that acne can, can be an issue, which we'll talk about in the next word too. But acne is an uncountable noun is just about that problem, skin problem in general, acne, bad acne. In a sentence, I had acne when I was a teenager. So the next word for today, there are two words here. There's pimple and zit. These are both words we use to refer to the individual um, parts of acne. Acne, we can say, I have bad acne, or maybe my acne is improving today. But acne is maybe the whole condition of your face, like everything, your, your face's situation. Each part, each one of those little uh, problem spots, we, we call that a pimple or a zit. The difference, pimple sounds a little bit smaller usually. Zit sounds a bit bigger and maybe maybe more painful. Um, so, uh, but either way, pimples and zits are both words we can use to describe acne. So in a sentence, I hate getting pimples. 10 words you can use to talk about hygiene or cleanliness. So let's be in. To wash your hands. The first expression is to wash your hands. To wash your hands is with soap and water uh, in the restroom somewhere. So wash your hands before cooking or wash your hands after using the toilet, for example. In a sentence, wash your hands after using the bathroom. To shower. 
The next expression is to shower, to shower, or to shower, or maybe you prefer to take a bath. So to shower is usually standing up, though you can do it sitting down depending on the country you live in, I suppose. To shower is that, yeah, the water just hits you continuously. To take a bath is you sit in the bathtub. You sit down and you are surrounded by water. That is a bath. Surrounded by water. <laughs> Sitting down surrounded by water in your home on purpose <laughs> is a bath. <laughs> if it's not on purpose, you should probably call a plumber. Because <laughs> that is not a bath, that is an emergency. <laughs> Ooh, all right. Uh, in a sentence, I shower every day, or I love taking a bath every once in a while. To brush your teeth. The next expression is to brush your teeth. To brush your teeth. So with a toothbrush, usually in the morning, maybe at night as well, you brush your teeth. You clean your teeth. Uh, in a sentence, make sure to brush your teeth in the morning. To style your hair. Uh, the next expression is to style your hair. To style your hair means to, to arrange or to fix your hair the way you like it. So today I styled my hair like this. You styled your hair like that. I, tomorrow maybe I'll style my hair in a ponytail. I probably won't. <laughs> but maybe you can put your, you can style your hair in a mohawk or in a faux hawk or in a bouffant. Bouffant, that's that, focus. Oh. Yeah, it's focusing. Yeah, that's a bouffant. All right, so to style your hair. Uh, in a sentence, uh, it takes a long time to style my hair. That's true, my hair is naturally explosive and so I have to straighten it before like everything. And then as soon as humidity gets it, it goes and it makes that sound too. To shave. The next expression is to shave. To shave is to remove hair, like if you're a man, here usually. Uh, to remove the hair here with a razor, with another, like a, a, a blade of some kind, or uh, maybe you remove body hair, or hair on your legs, whatever. Uh, you, we use the verb to shave, to shave uh, with a razor. In a sentence, shaving is a pain. <sighs> or sure, meaning shaving is troublesome soap or cleanser. The next word is soap or cleanser. So soap is just used to clean your skin or yeah to clean your face maybe uh, to clean your hands. We do not use soap for the stuff you use to clean your teeth. Soap is used for like body cleaner or maybe um, what you use to wash your clothes. Uh, so soap or uh, body cleanser. In a sentence, I like nice smelling soaps and cleansers. That is true, who does not? Hmm. Deodorant. The next word is deodorant, deodorant. So deodorant is the product you might put on your body to prevent unpleasant smells. So usually uh, it goes in this region. So this is called the armpit, this region. So arm and then pit. So like, yeah, kind of this cave-ish area in your arm. <laughs> we call it the armpit. Um, but uh, it's common to apply deodorant here. You might put it in other areas on your body. But the goal is uh, to prevent uh, bad smells or um, to, in some cases, just stop sweating completely. Uh, so this is deodorant. Well, deodorant actually, if I'm going to be strict here, deodorant is used to uh, stop unpleasant smells. Antiperspirant is used to prevent sweating. So perspirant comes from perspire. So to perspire means to sweat. Anti means not or stop. So an antiperspirant is an, a product to make you stop sweating. Hmm. So deodorant is the smell one. Antiperspirant is the sweat one. Sometimes you can buy a deodorant and antiperspirant together. Woohoo! Great. In a sentence, wearing deodorant is important, especially in summer. Mouthwash. The next word is mouthwash. Mouthwash, I hope, is easy to understand. It's wash. It's something to clean the inside of your mouth. So uh, you can use this like uh, in the morning maybe after you brush your teeth or after lunch maybe to keep your breath uh, smelling fresh uh, but it usually is in like a blue or a green or maybe an orange color and kind of has a minty or citrusy taste but you put it in your mouth and kind of swish like 
I don't know, I can't swish nothing. <laughs> you could swish it around in your mouth and then spit it out and that's mouthwash. So you've washed your mouth with this product. In a sentence, I like minty mouthwash. Toothpaste. The next word is toothpaste. So toothpaste, we do not say like tooth soap or tooth cleaner or whatever. We use toothpaste for uh, the product to clean our teeth. The product we use to brush our teeth is called toothpaste. Uh, so in a sentence, uh, I need to buy more toothpaste. Shampoo and conditioner. The next expression is shampoo and conditioner. So shampoo and conditioner are commonly used together uh, in the shower or in the bath, maybe. Shampoo usually comes first. We shampoo. Shampoo is soap for your hair, really. And then conditioner is a treatment for your hair. Conditioner uh, is used to make your hair feel softer or more moisturized. So oftentimes they are used for shampoo and then conditioner together as a set. So in a sentence, I like trying new shampoos and conditioner. Want to speak real English from your first lesson? Sign up for your free lifetime account at EnglishClass101.com. Okay. Know your verbs. Look at your verbs. Look at your verbs. <laughs> Hi, everybody. My name is Alicia. Welcome back to Know Your Verbs. In this episode, we're going to talk about the verb look. So let's go. The basic definition of the verb look is to use your eyes, to use your skills of vision. Uh, to, yeah, to use your eyes, to look, to turn your eyes towards something, to use your vision is to look. Uh, the difference between the verb see, if you watched the see episode of Know Your Verbs, see means to perceive something with the eyes. Look means like to focus the eyes on something, to direct your attention towards something. Whereas see is like to take in something, to perceive, to gain information with the eyes. Look is just focusing your attention in something, on something. Conjugations! Let's check out the conjugations of this verb. Present tense, look or looks. Past tense, looked. Past participle, looked. Progressive or continuous tense, looking. So let's check out some of the additional meanings of the verb look. First, to appear in accordance with. Here are some examples. She's had a rough year. Yeah, she looks it. Burn. Second example. He's 60? He doesn't look it. Okay, so in these example sentences, look is referring to matching some other information about a person or about a condition, about a situation. So in this case, uh, in the first example sentence, we hear, uh, she's had a rough year. And then the response to that is, yeah, she looks it. So it means it, uh, in other words, the it here means as though she's had a rough year. She looks, meaning she appears in accordance with the fact she has had a rough year. But that's a very long thing to say. Instead, we say, yeah, she looks it. She's, her appearance suggests what you have just said. She's had a rough year. Yeah, she looks it, where it equals rough year. And looks shows that matches. So her look matches this rough year fact we've learned about her. The second sentence is similar. Someone says, he's 60, meaning he's 60 years old. But we hear the negative response, he doesn't look it, meaning he does not appear as a 60-year-old man, meaning, in other words, he probably looks much younger than 60. He doesn't look it. Could be that he seems way, way older than 60 years old. Like if someone looks ancient, if someone has the appearance of a very, very old person, and you go, oh my gosh, he's 60? He doesn't look it. That's possible too. That's possible, I suppose. So you just have to gauge based on the intonation. Uh, so we can use an expression like that to mean someone is significantly younger or older. The next meaning is to seem, to seem. Here are some examples. This looks pretty tough. This is looking like it's going to be easier than I thought. In these example sentences, we can replace the verb look with seem and the meaning stays the same. So this looks pretty tough has the same meaning as this seems pretty tough. So to seem and to look have the same meaning in these examples. In the second example sentence, we saw 
This is looking like it's going to be easier than I thought. We can replace looking with seeming and the meaning stays the same. This is seeming like it's going to be easier than I thought. So both of these, we can simply replace the verb and we have the same meaning in these cases. So uh, look means to seem. Why would you use look instead of seem? What is the difference here? For me personally, I think seem sounds slightly more formal than look. I would not use seem in most cases. I would say looks in most cases uh, when I want to say seem. If I want to sound slightly more formal or slightly more polite, I would probably use seem. This seems to be the problem. What seems to be the problem? Instead of what looks like the problem? Look or looks like this one's your problem. Like look sounds like not nearly as formal. All right, next is to have in mind as a goal. To have in mind as a goal. Here are some examples. We're looking to buy a new car by the end of the month. He's looking to complete his job transfer by next month. So both of these sentences define a goal. They explain a goal. We're also using the progressive form of looking. So that means we are in the progress of working towards a goal or in the progress of uh, completing a goal. In the first example sentence, we're looking to buy a new car by the end of the month means our goal is to buy a new car by the end of the month and we are currently trying to do that. But this is quite a long expression, so instead we use look. We are looking to buy a new car. I suppose we could replace this with the verb aiming to. We're aiming to buy a new car. Aiming. Um, but aiming sounds rather formal and looking is a little bit more casual. So we're looking to buy a new car. In the second sentence, he's looking to complete his job transfer by next month. We see the same thing. His goal is to complete his job transfer and his aim is to do it by next month. So he is currently working towards his goal. He's looking to complete something. We use it in the progressive tense to show he is currently trying to achieve this goal, to achieve this outcome. The next meaning is to express with your eyes or with your face. So you're actually, you're creating an appearance with your eyes or your face, an expression, in other words. Here are some examples. She looked surprised. They look pretty angry. Here, both of these examples are talking about an expression, a facial expression, or some appearance that is created with the face or with the eyes. So in the first example, we see she looked surprised in past tense. This indicates that with her face, something about her face or her eyes showed surprise. She created a surprised face um, with her facial expression, in other words. So she looked surprised. In the second example, they look pretty angry, present tense. They look pretty angry means their facial expression appears angry. They are, what, something they are doing with their face or their eyes creates an angry look. Look is a noun here. So. Uh, to they look pretty angry is their expression appears angry. Let's go on to some variations of this. How can we pair other words with look to create a new meaning? First is look into, look into. This means to investigate. Here are some examples. We need to look into these accusations. Have you looked into the requirements for your license? Both of these mean to examine or to investigate something. So in the first example sentence, we need to look into these accusations, means we need to investigate these accusations. We need to maybe research, we need to um, search for more information about something. So look into kind of contains all of that. Find more information about something, but look into is much shorter and easier to say, to look into something. It does sound more casual. Uh, you could replace this with the verb investigate. We need to investigate these accusations instead of look into these accusations. Investigate sounds more formal than look into. In the second sentence, have you looked into the requirements for your license? We see the same thing. Have you investigated the requirements for your license? But investigated sounds quite polite, quite formal, so instead we use have you looked into, past tense. Have you looked into the requirements? Past tense shows investigation, but it doesn't sound so formal as investigate. The next variation is look the other way, look the other way. This means to direct your attention away from something unpleasant. Here are some examples. You can't just look the other way while your boss mistreats the employees in your company. We shouldn't look the other way when our fellow humans are in trouble. 
So these example sentences show the use of look the other way, meaning to look away from something unpleasant. In the first example about a boss mistreating employees in a company, it means we can't just turn our attention away from the mistreatment of the employees in the company, or we should not do that. That's a bad idea. We should not direct our attention away from this unpleasant situation. If there's a bad situation there, we should not ignore that situation. In other words, we should not look the other way. We should not turn our attention away from this bad situation. And in the second example sentence, we shouldn't look the other way when our fellow humans are in trouble. It's a more general statement, but if other humans, fellow humans, other people are in trouble, we should not uh, ignore it. We should not ignore it. We should not turn our attention in another way. Okay, so I hope that this video helped you level up your understanding of the verb look. If you have any questions or comments or know some other uses of the word look, please let us know in the comment section below this video. Thanks very much for watching this episode of Know Your Verbs. If you liked the video, give it a thumbs up, subscribe to the channel, and check us out at EnglishClass101.com for other good things too. Thanks very much for watching, and I'll see you again next time. Bye-bye. So many verbs. Look. Yeah. I am your father. Look at that. Look at that. Look at that. Dude. Look at that. Extremely correct. Use. Yep. Excellent work, French tour guide. <laughs> Examine. <laughs> I looked away. Ah! <laughs> I went. I didn't realize how much I used the verb look. Oh my gosh. Oh my gosh. Look. Hi, everybody. My name is Alicia. Welcome back to Know Your Verbs. In this episode, we're going to talk about the verb keep. Let's get started. The basic definition of the verb keep is to have in possession. So like to own something or to hold something is to keep. Here are the conjugations for this verb. Present tense, keep, keeps. Past tense, kept. Past participle tense, kept. Progressive tense, keeping. Now let's talk about some additional meanings of this verb. The first additional meaning for this lesson is to stop something from going somewhere. This can mean to stop a person, like from leaving or from going to another place, or to stop an object from moving or from going uh, somewhere. Let's look at some examples. Is our manager at the office? Can you keep her there for 10 more minutes? Okay, next one. Keep that car inside the gates. So don't let it go outside the gates. Keep it inside the gates. Meaning number two, additional meaning number two for the verb keep, to cause to remain in a condition or to cause to remain in a situation. Let's look at some examples. Sorry to keep you waiting. So here, sorry to keep, sorry to uh, make you stay in the waiting condition, in the waiting situation. Sorry to keep you waiting. The boss has kept us wondering about changes for months. That was past participle. The boss has kept us wondering. So we remain in the state of wondering here. The boss has kept us wondering for months. So has caused us to wonder continuously for a period of months is the meaning of this sentence. Meaning number three for this lesson is just to stay or to continue something. So this is a very broad example. Let's look at a couple examples. First, keep your head. Keep your head sounds really strange, right? So to keep your head doesn't mean like hold on to your head. So, but the expression keep your head means control your emotions. So here, your head doesn't refer to your head as the object necessarily. It refers to your emotions. So controlling your emotions. To keep your head means like to continue your uh, controlled emotional state. So. Uh, if someone is getting maybe ex too excited or they're getting really angry, you can say, keep your head. Let's look at another example, though. Keep in your lane. Keep in your lane. 
Neat. So it's like, imagine you're driving. So a lane is the lines on the road. Those are the lines on the road that people can drive cars in. So keep in your lane means stay in your lane. In other words, continue in your lane. We say keep, um, but it doesn't mean hold. It means continue in your lane. So if someone else, if maybe uh, the person you're driving with is trying to move to a different lane, you can say keep in your lane, just stay there. So it means stay. Another example might be keep quiet. Keep quiet means stay quiet or continue being quiet. But we just say keep quiet to mean continue that state. Meaning number four of keep is to persist in a behavior. So to persist means to do something many, many times, to continue doing something many times. In this case, a behavior. A behavior is repeating. So let's look at some examples. This guy keeps calling me. So a guy, in this case, keeps calling my phone. Keeps, he keeps calling me. So repeatedly, this person is calling me repeatedly. He keeps calling me. Another example. We kept sending messages until they responded. We kept sending messages until they responded. So meaning we continuously, we repeatedly sent messages to someone or maybe to a company until we received a response. So when we received a response, we stopped sending messages. We kept sending messages until they responded. Let's go on to some variations of the verb keep. The first variation is to keep an eye on someone. To keep an eye on someone. This expression means to watch, to watch, like to watch someone closely often too. Some examples. Yeah, she's keeping an eye on me. She always keeps an eye on the screen. Our boss keeps an eye on our work. Example, keep an eye on him. He's up to something. If someone says keep an eye on him or like keep an eye on her with that kind of suspicious intonation, this is kind of a negative expression. Like that person is suspicious. So watch that person to so keep an eye on him. But if you say it with an upward intonation, kind of happy, like, whoa, keep an eye on him. He's doing exciting things. That means like you should watch that person and expect something positive. Like we have positive expectations for that person. So this is an important phrase to listen to the intonation. Okay, next example of that though. I'm keeping my eye on you. I'm keeping my eye on you. So again, this is an expression where intonation is important. I'm keeping my eye on you and I'm keeping my eye on you have very different meanings. So I'm keeping my eye on you with that downward intonation sounds suspicious. I'm suspicious of you. I'm keeping my eye on you. If, however, we emphasize you with that kind of upward intonation in the sentence, I'm keeping my eye on you, it sounds like I'm expecting good things from you. I'm going to watch you with positive expectations. The next variation is to keep one's eyes open, to keep my eyes open, to keep your eyes open. So to keep your eyes open, uh, I use this actually a lot in like live streams, I think. I say like keep your eyes open for that or like keep an eye out for that. So actually you can use uh, keep your eyes open or keep an eye out. It's sort of a weird expression. So let's start with keep your eyes open. So plural eyes, two eyes. Keep your eyes open usually for a thing. Keep your eyes open for new ideas or I'll be keeping my eyes open for the exciting announcement. So that means I will be watching for an announcement or please watch for new ideas in the first example sentence. So keep your eyes open means watch for something, watch for something. The expression keep an eye out for means the same thing, but we use the singular eye. So keep an eye out for, new ideas, keep an eye out for an exciting announcement. 
we can use either the singular or the plural, I or eyes. So did you learn a little bit more about the word keep? I hope so. Uh, if you have some other meanings or if you know some other variations, have any questions, or if you want to try to make an example sentence, please feel free to do so in the comment section. Of course, if you like the video, please give us a thumbs up. You can subscribe to the channel and you can check us out for more good resources at EnglishClass101.com. Thanks very much for watching this episode of Know Your Verbs, and we'll see you again soon. Bye. Hi, everybody. My name is Alicia. Welcome to Know Your Verbs. In this episode, we're going to talk about the verb see. So let's get started. So the basic definition of see is to perceive with your eyes. So this really means to use your eyes to get information. You use your eyes to look at things, to maybe understand things, to gain knowledge uh, by looking at things, by using your eyes, focusing your eyes on things. You can learn things or gain information, gain knowledge. So this is to perceive. But the basic, the basic definition though is just to perceive with your eyes, to use your eyes to perceive, to gain uh, information, to gain knowledge. Okay, let's see the conjugations for the verb see. See, sees, saw, seen, seeing. Let's talk about a few additional meanings of the verb see. First one to form a mental picture of. To form a mental picture of means to use your mind to create an image. So see has the meaning of creating an image in your mind. For example, I can see my childhood home clearly. It was one story and had a big yard. What do you see when you close your eyes? So in these example sentences, we're not actually using our eyes to see something. In this use of the word see, we are imagining it. And in our minds, we are making a picture. Um, so we're not actually using our eyes to see these items. Instead, maybe they are things we saw in the past uh, and we are imagining them mentally. We are creating a mental image of something. So when I say, I can see my house clearly, my childhood house, it means in my mind, I can form a clear image of the house in my mind. In the question, what do you see? It means um, when you close your eyes, what's the mental image that appears in your mind? So see is used to create mental images, to refer to creating mental images here. Next is to examine or to watch. So in this use of the verb see, there's sort of the nuance of an expectation. We want to use our eyes to watch something as it changes or to examine a change as it happens, to examine a behavior. Let's see how the team does in today's match. I can't wait to see what the neighbors do when they realize we bought a pool. In the example of let's see how the team does in today's match, we are talking about using our eyes, our actual eyes, perhaps, if we are actually watching the match. If we go to the game or we see the match on TV, perhaps we are using our eyes. However, if we don't go to the match and we read the score from the game or we, we hear on the radio something about the game or we hear the results of the game, we can still use the verb see. See has this nuance of examining something. Um, so we're expecting some result. So let's see in this case um, doesn't only mean using your eyes to examine. It can mean to examine maybe the results of an out or the results of something, to examine the outcome of something. In the second example sentence, let's see how the neighbors react. <laughs> we see the same thing. Um, so it's the same, it's the same sort of nuance. We are expecting a reaction. We are going to watch for a reaction from the neighbors when they realize we bought a pool. So we want to examine their reaction. We want to examine an outcome. We can use the verb see 
though maybe we use our ears. Like if a neighbor says, oh my gosh, they bought a pool. Um, that's sort of examining, you're, you're waiting for a reaction there. We can still use the verb let's see, the expression let's see to talk about that. So let's see what happens next, for example. Next one. To make sure, to make sure. Please see that this task is finished. He saw that all the arrangements had been made. In these sentences, the verb see is used to mean make sure or to confirm something, to ensure something. In the first one, please see that this task is finished, we could replace the verb see with make sure. Please make sure that this task is finished. So that's a very clear sentence. Please see is just a shortened way of saying make sure. Please see that this task is finished. Please ensure that this task is finished. We can replace the verb here. The second example sentence is the same. He saw that all the arrangements had been made. So he made sure that all the arrangements had been made. In these example sentences, see is replacing the expression make sure or ensure. So we can use see to mean the same thing. It's just a shorter way of saying make sure. Next, to find acceptable or attractive. What do you see in him? What do you see in her? I don't understand what you see in this restaurant. It's terrible. What are the qualities you perceive in that person or the qualities that you can detect in that situation? What are the good points you identify there? We can use the word see to sort of communicate that quickly and easily. So what do you see in him? What do you see in her? Is a much shorter way of saying, what do you find attractive about him or her? What do you find appealing about him or her? Or what characteristics of that person attract you to that person. Saying, what do you see in him? What do you see in her? Is a much shorter way of saying, what qualities do you find attractive in that person? The same thing in the restaurant example. I don't understand what you see in this restaurant means, I don't understand what it is that you like about this restaurant. I think it's bad. So instead, we shorten it to, I don't understand what you see in this restaurant. So see means finding something attractive or interesting or appealing in some way. Now let's talk about some variations. So some slight changes or some additions to the verb see that change the meaning. First is see through, see through. See through means to understand the true nature of something, to understand the real characteristics of something. He saw through my attempts to work with him and asked me on a date. My boss saw through my lie and scolded me for faking sickness. So here we see the use in the past tense in the first example sentence. He saw through my attempts to work with him, meaning he saw the true nature of what I was doing. So he saw through my attempts to work with him and asked me on a date. So in the situation, maybe um, the person, the speaker, um, was trying to spend time with the he in this situation and was asking maybe to work together a lot, but he in the situation saw through, saw to the true nature of the speaker's request, saw the true characteristics or the actual desire there and asked the speaker on a date. So in this sentence, we understand that there was a different motivation. So something below the surface of the, uh, of the initial action that was happening. So um, the, the other person in the situation understood the other motivation, the motivation below the surface motivation. Um, and so we use saw through or see through to communicate that. So I, he saw through my attempts to work with him. And he understood there was something else I wanted to do. In the second example sentence, my boss saw through my lie and scolded me for faking sickness. So again, we see in past tense, uh, my boss saw through my lie. So saw that I was lying, in other words, saw through my lie. So saw the true character of my lie, saw the true nature of my statement and scolded me. So my boss understood I lied and scolded me for faking sickness. So I got in trouble because I was faking an illness, faking sickness. 
my boss saw through my behavior, saw the true character, understood the true nature of my, of my statement. Next is see eye to eye, see eye to eye. This means to have a common viewpoint or to agree. We don't see eye to eye most of the time. I'm glad we see eye to eye about this. So maybe this one is an easy one to visualize. So to see eye to eye with someone else means you agree with them, you share a viewpoint with them. So you can kind of imagine maybe two people standing across from one another and if they see eye to eye, maybe they match, their line of sight matches much in the way that their viewpoints or their opinions match. Exactly, <laughs> exactly. So they have kind of the same viewpoint. They can see eye to eye. So their, their, their eyesight maybe matches, their opinions match. So to see eye to eye, uh, we can say, I'm glad we see eye to eye about this, meaning I'm happy we agree about this. Or in a negative, we don't see eye to eye most of the time means we don't agree most of the time or we have different opinions most of the time. All right, so I hope that this video helped you level up your knowledge of the verb see a little bit. If you have any questions or comments or if you know another way of using the verb see, let us know in the comment section below the video. Thanks very much for watching. Please make sure to like the video, subscribe to the channel, and check us out at EnglishClass101.com for more good stuff. Thanks for watching this episode of Know Your Verbs, and we'll see you again soon. Bye-bye. We'll see you again soon. <laughs> uh <-huh. laughs> we end every video on this channel almost with see yeah. you again soon. But of course, I don't actually see you. You see me. We imagine you. We have we form mental images oh. in our minds of all of you watching in the camera there. All those hundreds of thousands of you guys. That's kind of terrifying. <laughs> see? <laughs> <laughs> that was fun. Ask not what you can do for your channel. Ask what your channel can do for you, what? Hi everybody, welcome back to Know Your Verbs. My name is Alicia, and in this episode, we're going to talk about the verb ask. So let's get started. The basic definition of the verb ask is to make a request, to make a request. Here are the conjugations. Present tense, ask, asks, past tense, asked, past participle, asked, continuous or progressive, asking. Let's talk about some additional meanings of this verb. First is to require. Here are some examples. You're asking too much of us. They asked a lot of him this year. So in these example sentences, the verb ask means to require or to require something from someone else. In the first sentence, you're asking too much of us means you're requiring too much of us, or you're requiring too much of something we are able to do. Asking too much shortens this expression. So it's not only require, but like requiring the capabilities or requiring something a person or a machine or an object is able to do. So require, yes, but also require plus capabilities. In the second sentence, we see this as well. So the second sentence was, they asked a lot of him this year. So they required a lot of him. We can't quite replace require for asked here, uh, but we can, the nuance here of ask is they required a lot of his capabilities or they required a lot of work from him this year. So asked instead condenses all of that, requiring him, requiring his work or his service or something. So. We condense all of that into one word, ask, here. The next meaning is to set as a price. Here are some examples. The seller is asking $10,000 for the boat. She asked for $100 for her old laptop. All right, in both of these example sentences, ask shows the price of an item, the price a seller chooses for an item or the price the seller hopes to receive for an item. It's the price that the seller has set for something. In the first example, we see asking in the progressive or the continuous tense. The seller is asking $10,000, meaning the seller currently hopes to receive $10,000 for the boat. So if it's helpful, you can imagine the seller asking the buyer for this amount, the seller requesting this amount from the buyer for this amount. So the seller is asking for $10,000 for the boat, uh, is, but we, we remove the preposition for, asking $10,000 for the boat. 
is essentially requesting the seller for $10,000. So requesting the seller for is like a long way of saying this expression. We can shorten this to asking. The buyer is asking $10,000 for. In the second example sentence, we see she asked for $100 for her old laptop. So in this example sentence, we do see the preposition for. She asked for $100 for her old laptop. We can include the preposition for, but it is okay to drop it in these cases where it is clear that the meaning is a price for an item. So she asked is past tense. So a past tense situation, she wanted to receive $100 for her old laptop, meaning she asked for or she requested the buyer pay $100 for her old laptop. So requested the buyer pay is shortened to asked for in this case. So we can use it uh, with or without the for preposition. The next meaning is to call on for an answer. Here are some examples. He asked his boss about the upcoming changes. She asks her neighbors for help every year. So to ask in these cases, it's not quite a request in this case, but rather we're looking for information. We're looking for an answer. We have a question about something or we need uh, some information and so we uh, inquire um, for information. I suppose you can think of it like making an information request in that way, um, but we're looking for some kind of answer. We go to someone to get information, to get an answer about a question. In the first example, he asked his boss about the upcoming changes. The information he wants is about these changes maybe at his company. So he asks means he's looking for an answer. He asked his boss for information. He's looking for an answer about something. In the second sentence, she asks her neighbors for help every year means she's looking for answers, something she needs an answer to. She's looking for help. She's looking for assistance, answers for some problem that she has. So she inquires about information. She's looking for information. So to get an answer to something, um, like a problem or an issue you need to solve, we can use ask. Next is to invite, to invite. Here are some examples. I asked some friends to come over this weekend. Why don't you ask your coworkers to go out for a drink? So in the first example sentence, we can replace asked in the past tense with invited in past tense, and the meaning stays the same. I invited some friends to come over this weekend. We can use invite, of course, if we want, but invite sounds slightly more formal than ask. Instead of using the more formal invite, we can use the more casual ask, like I asked some people to come over this weekend. Sounds slightly less formal than invited. In the second example sentence, the same thing is true. Why don't you ask your coworkers to go out for a drink? We can replace ask here with invite. Why don't you invite your coworkers out for a drink? Again, invite sounds slightly more formal than ask. So ask sounds a little bit more casual, so it sounds maybe a little bit more natural and a little more friendly um, than the word invite. Okay. Now let's look at some other words we can add to ask to make different meanings. First is ask for it, ask for it. This means to behave in a way that invites punishment or retribution. So retribution means like, um, it can refer to punishment or it can refer to it can refer to a reward as well but in this case it's more for a negative reaction a negative reaction let's look at some examples the drunk guy in the bar is shouting at everyone he's really asking for it your boyfriend broke up with you well you kind of asked for it you never made time for him so in these example sentences we are uh, we see some behaviors that maybe invite punishment or that invite a negative outcome in the first example, a drunk person in a bar is shouting at everybody. So the speaker says he's really asking for it, meaning the drunk guy is inviting punishment, is inviting a negative outcome because of his behavior. He's really asking for it. We see that this is, this is used in the progressive form. He's asking for it, meaning that his current behavior, the behavior he is showing now, is inviting punishment or as inviting a negative outcome. In the second sentence where a speaker is probably having a conversation with someone, they say, you broke up with your boyfriend? Well, you kind of asked for it, past tense, because you didn't make time for him. You didn't make any time for him shows that perhaps in the past, the listener did not uh, behave in a way that invited a positive outcome, meaning you asked for your boyfriend to break up with you or you invited this negative outcome because of your actions. You did not make time for your boyfriend, therefore he broke up with you. So 
you did not have the correct behavior, you invited negative, a negative outcome because of your actions. Okay, the next one is ask for trouble. Ask for trouble. This means to behave in a way that is likely to end in trouble. This is very similar to ask for it, uh, but instead of just receiving punishment, it could just be a troubling situation that results. Let's look at some examples. That kid is running around kicking his classmates. He's just asking for trouble. Trying to enter the country without a passport is just asking for trouble. So in both of these sentences, we see asking for trouble is used in the progressive tense. So some action, doing some action is likely to result in a troubling situation in the future. Perhaps it's not necessarily punishment, but it's going to cause trouble. It's going to cause a problem. In the first example, a kid running around kicking his classmates is a bad behavior and it's going to invite trouble. In this case, it's probably going to be punishment, but to say he's really asking for it m might suggest something a little bit too violent. Like to say he he's really asking for it sounds a little bit too much for a little kid. Um, so perhaps he's asking for trouble suggests that he's causing a troubling situation. The kid might not have like severe strong punishment as a result of his actions, but he could end up in trouble because of his behavior. In the second example, trying to enter the country without a passport is just asking for trouble. It doesn't necessarily mean that there will be a punishment for trying to enter the country. While it might be likely that trouble does result or that punishment does result, um, it's more general to say just asking for trouble. So this action, trying to enter the country without a passport, this action is just asking for trouble, is, so is inviting some troubling situation to occur. Okay, I hope that this video helped you level up your understanding of the verb ask. If you have any questions or comments or if you know a different way of using the verb ask, please let us know in the comment section below this video. If you liked the video, please make sure to give it a thumbs up, subscribe to the channel, and check us out at EnglishClass101.com for some more resources. Thanks very much for watching this episode of Know Your Verbs, and I'll see you again next time. Bye-bye. Ask and you shall receive coffee. We've asked all the questions today. Goodbye. Verb, 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 verb. The verb is the word. Verb, 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 verb. That's hard to say. Hi, everybody. My name is Alicia. Welcome back to Know Your Verbs. In this episode, we're going to talk about the verb work. Let's get started. The basic definition of the verb work is to fulfill duties for money or for compensation. Compensation means payment. So for example, salary or an hourly wage. So compensation. So to do things in exchange for money is work. This is a basic definition of the verb work. Now let's look at the different conjugations of this verb. Present tense, work, works. Past tense, worked. Past participle tense, worked. Progressive tense, working. Now let's talk about some additional meanings of the verb work. Meaning one, the first additional meaning is to function correctly. To function correctly means an object uh, is behaving, is functioning in the proper way. So let's look at some examples. My computer isn't working today. What happened? The mechanic fixed my car and now it works perfectly. Meaning two. Yeah, yeah. Okay, the second definition is to produce a desired effect or result or to succeed at something. So some examples of this meaning. His plan is crazy, but I think it might work. I don't think that'll work. Fun fact, I took that example sentence, I don't think that'll work, from a video game called Indiana Jones and the Fate of Atlantis. I don't think that'll work. Next one is to control or to cause to labor. To cause to labor. So labor means like to fulfill your duties, to work as in the first, the original basic meaning of this word. So let's look at some examples. Management worked the team way too hard last year. Today, we're working the computer remotely.
Now, let's look at some variations. The first variation is work on, work on. Work on means to try to affect or like to try to influence, to try to persuade someone. Some examples of this. Politicians often work on voters' fears. So to work on someone's fears, it's like they're affecting that. They are um, trying to persuade people by focusing on their fears in this example sentence. The movie works on viewers' sympathy. So here, work works on, the movie works on, means the movie kind of is affecting, is affecting the sympathy of the viewer. And then as a result, influence happens. So a change in emotion happens in this way, to work on. The second variation is work out, work out. So work out means to exercise. Work out can mean to lift weights, to jog, to do sports, whatever. Work out just means exercise. Examples of this, uh, I never work out. She's been working out three days a week for the last year, overachiever. The third variation for this lesson is work up, work up. So work up means to gradually make progress, but with difficulty. Examples of this, he worked up to asking the girl on a date. She worked her way up to becoming CEO of a company. So to work up to something is like slowly and with difficulty making progress. So we can split this phrasal verb, like she worked her way up, or he worked up to asking the girl on a date. So we pair work with the preposition up in this example. Okay, do you know a little bit more about the verb work? If you have any other variations, or if you know a different meaning of the verb work, or if you just want to practice making a sentence with this verb, please feel free to do so in the comment section. All right, if you like the video, please make sure to give it a thumbs up, subscribe to the channel if you haven't already, and check us out at EnglishClass101.com for some other good study resources. Thanks very much for watching this episode of Know Your Verbs. We'll see you again soon. Bye. We can work it out. We're working now. Live to work, work to live, which will you be? Her pen works. <laughs> it's true, she just drew a picture of me. Uh, Do it now. Have you ever thought about how much you think about thinking? <laughs> Hi everybody, my name is Alicia. Welcome to Know Your Verbs. In this episode, we're going to talk about the verb think. So let's get started. The basic definition of think is to have in the mind. So something you can keep in your mind, like an idea or an image, something you keep in your head, something in your mind, something in your brain. So to keep in the mind is think, to think. This is the basic definition of think. So let's look at the conjugations of the verb think. Present tense, think, thinks. Past tense, thought. Past participle, thought. Progressive or continuous tense, thinking. Think, thinks. Thought, thought. Thinking. Okay. Let's look at some additional meanings of the verb think. First is to consider or to reflect on or to ponder. It means consider something carefully or spend time considering something. So ponder means to think for a long time or to think hard about something. Um, so consider carefully, reflect on. Examples. Can I have a day to think about this? He's thinking about what to do next. So in these example sentences, can I have a day to think about this? Taking one day to reflect on something, like before you make a decision, is a pretty common thing to do before like a big decision. So can I have a day to think about this? Means can I have a day to consider this carefully? Or can I have a day to ponder this? In the second example sentence, he's thinking about what to do next means he's considering carefully his next step. He's considering carefully what he should do next. So thinking is used in the progressive tense here to show that he is currently at this time considering something carefully. But to consider carefully, we can make shorter and use the verb 
thinking. He's thinking about what to do next. Okay. Next is to create something by thinking or to create something by considering. We usually use this with the word up after the verb think. We thought up so many crazy party ideas in college. She thought up a plan for product promotion. So both of these example sentences mean to create something by considering it in your mind. So in the first example sentence, we thought up crazy ideas for parties in college means we designed something using our brains. We considered something and created an idea. We created something by thinking. So to think up, blah, blah, blah. So we thought up crazy party ideas. So we designed crazy party ideas by thinking about them, by considering things in our minds. In the second example sentence, we see the same meaning, but for a business situation. She thought up a plan for product promotion. So in this case, past tense, she thought up, she designed a plan for product promotion. But when we say designed, um, it sounds maybe like she planned something on a computer, perhaps. When we use she thought up, it means she used her mind. She considered the ideas she had and created a plan in her mind for promotion of the product. So thought up uses the mind to create something. Next is to have as an expectation. To have as an expectation, to expect something. I didn't think you'd arrive so quickly. We thought it would take a lot longer to finish dinner. So in the first example sentence, we didn't think you'd arrive so quickly. It means the speaker expects that the listener would take longer to arrive, or the listener was going to arrive later than they actually did. So the speaker, the speaker in this case, had the expectation that the listener was going to arrive later. So they used the negative, we didn't think you'd arrive so quickly. So we didn't think, we didn't expect you to arrive so quickly. We can replace the verb think with expect here, um, and it creates the same meaning, the same nuance, really. But think sounds a little bit less formal than expect. So we didn't think you'd arrive so quickly. The second example sentence is, we thought it would take a lot longer to finish dinner. Again, we expected, we had the expectation it would take a lot longer to finish dinner. We can replace the verb thought, past tense, with the past tense expected. We expected it would take a lot longer to finish dinner. So in this way, think, or in past tense, thought, uh, is used in exactly the same way as expected here. The next meaning is to consider suitability. To consider suitability. Let's look at some examples. I've never thought of him like a manager. We're thinking of her for a higher position. So in the first sentence, I've never thought of him like a manager. In this way, thought means I've never uh, understood him to be suitable for the position of manager. That's a very long way of explaining this sentence. But to condense everything, we use the word thought. I've never thought of him as a manager. It means I've never considered him to potentially be suitable as a manager. In the second example sentence, we're thinking of her for a higher position. It means we're considering whether or not she is suitable for a higher position at her job or a higher position at her company. So in this way, thinking in the progressive tense means we are considering her suitability for a position, a higher level position. So you'll notice that the two example sentences included here are related to work. You'll see though that this, this meaning tends to be used a lot with uh, jobs and maybe political positions. So kind of something um, maybe promotion related. So promotion related or kind of hierarchy related. You'll often hear this in work situations, employment situations. Let's look at some variations, some other words we can attach to think to create different meanings. First is think better of, think better of. Think better of means to reconsider and make a better decision or make an improved decision. It means to consider something again and change your decision, hopefully to make a, an improved decision. Examples. I wanted to say something, but I thought better of it and kept my mouth shut. We'll think better of you if you tell the truth. So in both of these sentences, there's a reconsideration. Someone is considering something again 
and making an improved decision because of that reconsideration. So in the first example sentence, I wanted to say something, we see in past tense, I wanted to say something, but I thought better of it. So it in this case is the thing I wanted to say in the first part of the sentence. I thought better of it means I reconsidered it and decided against my, my first inclination. I decided not to do the first thing I was thinking about. And I kept my mouth shut. So in this case, uh, my mouth remained closed. In other words, I reconsidered my initial action, the action I initially wanted to do. In the second sentence, we'll think better of you if you tell the truth. We see it's, it's used uh, for future. We will think better of you if you tell the truth, meaning if you tell the truth, our opinion of you will improve. We will think better of you. Um, so tell the truth and we'll consider you again, essentially, and our opinion of you will improve if you do this. The next variation is think much of, think much of. This means to have a positive view of or to approve of. Examples. He doesn't think much of his professor. We didn't think much of last night's dinner. We see in the first example sentence, um, he didn't think much of his professor means he didn't really approve of his professor or he didn't have a very positive view of his professor. So uh, a shorter way to explain that feeling is he didn't think much of his professor. In the second example sentence, we didn't think much of last night's dinner. This means, again, we didn't really approve of last night's dinner or we don't have a very positive view or a very positive opinion of last night's dinner. These are rather long, so we can condense it to we didn't think much of last night's dinner. So I hope that this video helped you level up your knowledge of how to use the verb think. If you have any questions or comments or if you know another way to use the word think, please let us know in the comment section below the video. If you liked the video, please give it a thumbs up, subscribe to the channel, and check us out at EnglishClass101.com for other good things too. Thanks very much for watching this episode of Know Your Verbs, and I will see you again soon. Bye-bye. I think that your thought about my thought is a thinking thought. What? My name is Alicia Olin for this episode. <laughs> First is... <laughs> I'm thinking about summer. Uh -huh. Gossip. Let's go. Oh my god. So... The first phrase is, oh my god, so. so Oh my god, so is an introductory phrase you can use to start your topic with like a surprise factor. So you say, oh my god, and then so is your transition phrase. So for example, oh my god, so I have to tell you about this movie I saw. Or oh my god, so I saw my neighbor in the shopping mall this morning. Or oh my god, so did you see my new dog? It's kind of a weird one. Usually it's about a person, not about a dog, but who knows. You won't believe what happened to me the other day. The next expression is, you won't believe what happened to me the other day. You won't believe what happened to me the other day. Meaning, something happened to you, and you think it's going to be a surprise to the person listening to you. You won't believe what happened to me the other day. So it's a very fast phrase because it sounds like you want to share very quickly. Like, you won't believe what happened to me. You can drop the other day if you want, or you, say, you can say, you won't believe what happened to me this morning. You won't believe what happened to me last night. You won't believe what happened to me this weekend. You won't believe what happened to me over my winter vacation. So that you won't believe what happened to me gets very, very quick and short. So examples, uh, you won't believe what happened to me the other day. I ran into my ex-boss or, you won't believe what happened to me the other day. I tripped and fell down a flight of stairs. Or, uh, you won't believe what happened to me the other day. I got a new parrot. Sure, I don't know. Maybe one of you can use that. Guess what? The next phrase is very short. The next phrase is like an exclamation, so an excited statement and a question. Guess what? Guess what? So, Guess what is inviting the listener to guess what happened to you? Guess what? Uh, the full question would be guess what happened or guess what happened to me? But we only say guess what? So guess what? And sometimes the listener guesses and sometimes the listener just says 
what? <laughs> Usually the listener just says, what? Uh, as so meaning you should continue the story. So if you say, guess what? I quit my job or guess what? I saw my best friend with a new guy I haven't seen before. <gasps> Another example, uh, guess what? I got a new car. Something like that. So some kind of shocking, like um, difficult to guess situation. I haven't told you about this yet. The next expression is, I haven't told you about this yet. I haven't told you about this yet. So have not becomes haven't. I haven't told you about this yet. So maybe you've told, you have told other people, but this specific person, maybe you have not told that person your news or some information yet. But this yet implies you are planning to, or you want to tell them this. So uh, it's, it's kind of creates a little suspense. I haven't told you about this yet. So we could use this like, I haven't told you about this yet. I'm going to France next summer. Or I haven't told you about this yet, but I broke up with my boyfriend last night. Or I haven't told you about this yet, but I'm throwing a big party for my coworker this weekend. Can you come? Other examples, I haven't told you about this yet. I saw my boss out for dinner with someone who's not his wife. <gasps> Oh my god, that's not true. <laughs> that's not true. Or I haven't told you about this yet. I heard that the company is gonna go bankrupt. <gasps> also not true. <laughs> okay, so those are some pretty juicy, juicy gossip. That's an expression we use. We say juicy gossip is something that's like really, really interesting gossip or a really interesting story about people. We say juicy gossip for that. Have you heard about? The next expression is have you heard about blah, blah, blah. Have you heard about can be followed with a noun phrase. Have you heard about uh, a, a person? You can use a person or have you heard about a situation? You can use both. Uh, you can use a, an object too. So have you heard about the new iPhone or have you heard about the new office policies? Um, you can use that um, for pretty much anything um, you want to inform your listener about. So, have you heard about is usually said very quickly, have you heard about? So the you becomes shortened to ya. Have you heard about? Have you heard about blah, blah, blah. So, have you heard about the new secretary? Have you heard about our new boss? Or have you heard about my coworker quitting his job? Have you heard about the neighbors above us? They're moving. So you can use people here for gossip expressions, or you can use objects um, in this expression just to introduce something new. Very useful phrase. Have you heard about my mom? <laughs> Sorry, mom. I don't know why you came into that one. Okay. So the other day, the next expression is kind of like the beginning to a story. So maybe this can be for gossip. Maybe it can just be like a story, something that interesting or maybe boring that happened to you. The expression is, so the other day, so the other day, so the other day, the other day here means not today, some other day, which day it doesn't really matter. It's not really important, but we say the other day, some day in the past, this expression is used for it. So we can say, so the other day I was sitting at my desk in the office when my manager came and asked if he could speak to me. Dun, dun, dun. Or so the other day I was shopping and I ran into my ex-boyfriend. Or so the other day I was renting a car and the former president of the United States came into the car rental shop. What? All right, so the other day, just some day in the past. So I was talking with, and the next one you can use um, maybe for gossip sometimes, but also you can use for making plans. It's, so I was talking with someone and blah, blah, blah. So I was talking with someone means you were having a conversation uh, at another time with a person and you want to kind of report information or share something from that conversation with the person listening now. So I might say, so I was talking with Risa and I think that we should plan a party for this weekend. What do you think? So I was talking with my team about this and I think that we should make some changes. So that's a very kind of everyday work situation use of this phrase. 
Um, but you can also use it for gossip, like, so I was talking to my best friend and I think I'm gonna move. Or I was talking to my parents and I think it's best if we break up. Oh. So it can be for plans, it can be for gossip, it can be for just any conversation plus a report. What's up with? The next expression is kind of a little like mysterious. Then the expression is, what's up with blah, blah, blah. Usually what's up with person for gossip, meaning there's like the nuance here is there's some problem or it seems like something's wrong with this person. They're unhappy, they're sad, they're angry, uh, some kind of negative emotion. We use this. So it's like, what's up with Stevens? I haven't heard from him lately. What's up with your brother? He seems really upset. Or what's up with your neighbor? Why is he so noisy? Or what's up with your boss? He's so strict. So it sounds like there's some problem. We usually use this intonation. What's up with, what's up with meh to introduce somebody who has a problem. We don't say what's up. It's not that, it's not that sort of hello um, expression. It's a, it's an expression for a problem. You can also use a noun phrase that is not a person here. Like what's up with this new office policy or What's up with this new rule at work? Or what's up with this new item on the menu at this restaurant? It's super weird. So what's up with blah, blah, blah has sort of a negative nuance. You can use it for people to talk about strange behavior. What's up with you? Have you heard from lately? The next expression is have you heard from blah, blah, blah lately? Have you heard from person lately? Have you heard from Stevens lately? I haven't seen him. Have you heard from your mom lately? Have you heard from your dad lately? Have you heard from your brother lately? Have you heard from your landlord lately? I don't know why you hear from your landlord, but have you heard from someone lately? There is sort of an ex like a little bit of an expectation that you are in contact with the person involved in this sentence. Like you have some relationship, maybe it's a family relationship, romantic relationship, professional relationship. There's some relationship with this person and lately, it's like, have you heard from them recently, lately, uh, in the last few days, in the last few weeks? Um, so you can use this if, for example, you are looking for someone or you're worried about someone, you can use this here. Um, you can also use it just, just to check in about some other person without asking that person directly. So like if I want to ask about, I'm using Risa in my example, Risa is our Japanese channel host. Um, if I want to ask about how Risa is, but I don't want to ask Risa, I know maybe she's busy or I don't know, for some reason I, I, it's difficult to talk to her. I can ask like a coworker, I can say, hey, have you heard from Risa lately? It seems she's really busy. Or have you heard from so-and-so lately? It seems they're busy. So if I want to ask about another person, but I don't want to bother this person or that something makes it difficult, uh, I can use, have you heard from blah, blah, blah recently or lately? to ask about them. Very useful phrase. I have to tell you about next expression. Um, ah, the next expression is I have to tell you about blah, blah, blah. I have to tell you. So have to becomes have to. I have to tell you about. It has a nice mm, mm, mm sound. I have to tell you about blah, blah, blah. Or I have to tell you about something. So I have to tell you about my weekend. I have to tell you about Stevens. I have to tell you about my mom. I have to tell you about my boyfriend. I have to tell you about my girlfriend. Whatever it is, some person used at the end of this sentence creates a nuance like there's exciting news about that person. Or I have to tell you about this thing that happened. You can use a situation at the end of the sentence too, but you're using I have to at the beginning of the sentence. So that sounds like it's really important, like I feel it's so important, it's my responsibility to tell you because this is so exciting. Of course, you can use this in more boring situations as well, like I have to tell you about the new office policy. <laughs> you can use it in that way with a very flat intonation, but for gossip purposes, use I have to tell you about blah, blah, blah. That sounds really good. So what do you have to tell somebody about? I have to tell you about this new idea I have for a business. Or I have to tell you about what happened to me last night. <gasps> okay, so there are these really exciting ways that we can introduce things that happened or that we can talk about people or whatever. Okay, 10 words for talking about space. Planet, 
The first word is planet. Planet. So planets are those really, really big things that we have in our solar system. Now there are officially eight because Pluto is no longer considered a planet. In my example sentence, Pluto used to be considered a planet. Star. The next word is star, star. So stars are those very, very bright objects that you can see in the sky sometimes at night. The closest star to us is the sun. The sun is a star, and we can see a lot of other stars if we look up into the night sky sometimes. In a sentence, it's hard to see stars from big cities. Solar system. The next expression is solar system. Solar system. So solar system, in our case here on planet Earth, refers to the system of planets and objects which are near our star. So our solar system, now there are eight planets in our solar system. Used to be nine planets, sorry again, Pluto. Eight planets in our solar system. And then um, we can talk about other objects which maybe enter our solar system, like, uh, like uh, comets, for example, or a meteor, or uh, some other events might happen in space within our solar system. So our solar system is the area surrounding our sun and our planets that we know of. In a sentence, Mercury is part of our solar system. Comet. The next expression is comet. A comet is actually an icy body that is uh, slightly melting and then releasing gases. So that's what produces that look, a comet. Okay, in a sentence, comets are really cool. Meteor. All right, so yes, the next word is meteor, meteor, or just meteor. So essentially, meteors are different from comets because comets are made of ice. Meteors, however, are made of rock. So these are two different kinds of objects that can that move around uh, in space. In a sentence, uh, lots of meteors burn up before they pass through the atmosphere. Meteorite. Uh, the next word is meteorite, meteorite. So this is an important distinction that many people don't know about, actually. This drives me crazy, too. So a meteor is the, is the space rock. It's in space or it's in the atmosphere. A meteorite, however, is the rock if, if the meteor makes it, if the meteor can pass through the Earth's atmosphere and fall to the surface of the Earth. That rock, then, is called a meteorite. So in space, uh, in the atmosphere, it's a meteor. When it falls to Earth, it is a meteorite. That becomes a meteorite when it hits the Earth. So, fun facts. Okay, that's the difference between the two. In a sentence, have you ever seen a meteorite? Supernova. Supernova, supernova. So, the explosion of a star is a huge event. A supernova is the name of it. So, the star explodes, and that's what we call it. It's called a supernova, a star explosion. In a sentence, supernovas must be incredible things. Black hole. Ah, uh, all right, the next expression is black hole. Black hole. Black holes are the subject of a lot of study. Uh, they have intense gravitational pull, so meaning they have very strong gravity. Uh, black holes will pull other objects into them. Um, it is said that like uh, time stops in a black hole, or in, like if you get too close to a black hole, if you get too close to the event horizon of a black hole, you yourself will be pulled into that hole too. It's pretty crazy. So like the event horizon is the point at which um, there's, no, there's no turning back from, like you can't, you can't escape essentially uh, the gravitational pull of a black hole once you're within the event horizon of that space. It's like crazy, you're done for. All this kind of stuff is so interesting. So in a sentence, black holes are mysterious galaxy. Okay, uh, all right, so the next word is galaxy, galaxy. Before we talked about the expression solar system, uh, so solar system is kind of our region of space, uh, the region we're familiar with. But the next step up, so if you think of the solar system as kind of your neighborhood a little bit, you could think of maybe the galaxy as like your city or your country maybe. It's sort of the next step out. So a galaxy is made up of lots and lots of stars, maybe other planets, other solar system, many other solar systems in one galaxy. So uh, I think, yeah, we belong to the Milky Way galaxy, I believe. In a sentence, our galaxy is made of lots of different stars and planets. Earth. The next expression is Earth. Earth. Earth is our planet. Earth is the planet we live on. Earth is, yeah, habitable, meaning humans can live here. This word, I included it in this vocabulary list because it is a very good word to practice your pronunciation. It is the word Earth. 
earth. That R and the TH sound can be difficult to pronounce together. Earth, earth. So this is a great word to use to practice your pronunciation. Earth. So in a sentence, our planet is called Earth. About 10 words for talking about sleep. Let's go. To wake up. The first word is to wake up. To wake up is to open your eyes, probably in your bed or the place where you are sleeping. To wake up is to, uh, to become conscious, to become awake. <laughs> Every day you wake up, uh, presumably, hopefully. In a sentence, I woke up three times last night. To get up, to get out of bed. All right, the next word is to get up or to get out of bed. So that means to physically move your body from your bed out of bed, to stand up from your bed, to get out of your bed. We say to get up or to get out of bed. In a sentence, I got up at eight o'clock this morning. To snooze. The next word is to snooze. So we have to snooze an alarm and also to snooze. So to snooze means to take a short sleep, to have a short sleeping time. Or to snooze an alarm is uh, when your alarm goes off in the morning, you have a button. Most alarm clocks have some button you can press so the alarm will turn on again in like you know, five or 10 minutes or something. So to snooze an alarm is to, like, to ask your alarm to wake you up again a few minutes later, that's uh, to snooze. So we have to snooze an alarm and to snooze, meaning like a short, light sleep. In a sentence, I always snooze my alarm at least once. That is usually true. <laughs> to oversleep. The next word is to oversleep. To oversleep means to sleep too much or to sleep late. Uh, actually, no, it doesn't mean to sleep late. Uh, to sleep late means just to sleep until a late time in the day. Uh, oversleep means sleeping beyond the time you wanted to get up. So for example, if my alarm is set for eight o'clock, but I wake up at nine o'clock, I overslept. I slept beyond my wake up time. So we can use oversleep to talk about times when you sleep too much. You sleep uh, more than your body needs you to. So maybe your body needs, depending on the person, like six to nine hours or so. But if you sleep like 14 hours, we can say that's oversleeping. You're sleeping too much. Mm. That's the nuance here. In a sentence, I overslept on my first day of work. Nap. The next word is nap. Nap is a short sleep. So a nap is maybe 30 minutes, one hour, just a short sleep, a short rest. So a lot of people will take a nap in the afternoon, for example, or maybe children actually take naps, for example, in preschool or when they're very, very young. They have a, an afternoon nap, a short sleep, like, mm, yeah, just a, like an hour or so, I imagine. In a sentence, I love naps. Actually, I do like naps. I don't like naps because when I take a nap, it becomes a sleep. It's always like I wake up four hours later and I'm like, well, okay, well, I've destroyed my sleep schedule. Dream. The next word is dream. Dream. So dreams are those, those visions, those images you see, those ex maybe experiences it seems like you have when you are asleep. In a sentence, I always have weird dreams. Nightmare. So the next word is nightmare. Nightmare is a word which means bad dream or scary dream, negative dream. So uh, children maybe have nightmares a lot. They wake up crying or they're really upset by nightmares, monsters, uh, terrifying things happening and so on. In a sentence, do you ever have nightmares? To go to bed. The next word is to go to bed. So before we talked about to get up or to get out of bed, this is the opposite. To go to bed means to get in your bed, uh, to, to try to go to sleep, to go to bed. In a sentence, I usually go to bed fairly late. To hit the hay, to hit the sack. The next expression is kind of a, I don't know, a slang expression. Uh, we have to hit the hay and to hit the sack. These both mean to go to bed. Um, they both mean to try to fall asleep, but we just use them in more casual situations. The image here of hit the hay is with your body 
hitting hay, like laying down in hay. Uh, I believe historically because uh, hay was used to stuff um, things that people slept on. Um, so that's why we have this expression to hit the hay with your body. Same thing for to hit the sack. So a sack full of something soft to sleep on uh, is where this expression comes from. In a sentence, I think I'm going to hit the hay to fall asleep. The next expression, it is to fall asleep. To fall asleep, you're in bed and you finally, you lose consciousness. You, you stop being aware. You are asleep. In that moment, we say you fall asleep. In a sentence, it takes me a long time to fall asleep. All right. Want to speak real English from your first lesson? Sign up for your free lifetime account at EnglishClass101.com. Top 10 must-know prepositions and conjunctions for English learners. Let's get started. Two. Two. I threw the ball to my dad. Two is sort of directional. It, it's saying that it's going towards something. I wrote a letter to my mother. I went to the mall. I went to the park. My mom asked me to go to the store to buy some bread, to a destination, to a person. From, from, from is the opposite of to. From implies where it's coming from, the place of origin. So if I'm going to the mall, I'm coming from my house. This letter is from my daughter, from. How long does it take you to get from your house to your job? To and from, they go together. With, with, with. It means together with something. I am at the movies with my friend. I went out to eat with my friends. I go shopping with my boyfriend. With means you are together with something. I like to have grilled cheese with tomatoes on it. I'm here with my book, at. At, at is a very short word. I always go to bed at 11 o'clock, if I'm lucky. I usually go to bed at around one in the morning, unfortunately, I get very little sleep. At specifies a time or a place. Let's go to the movies at two in the afternoon. Um, I'm at home right now. Where are you? We decided to meet at the beach. It's a pinpoint of time or location. In. In. In means you are inside of something or in the middle of something. It means being immersed in something. I am in bed right now. The cat is in the box. Uh, the child is in the tree. The plane is in the sky. I graduated school in 2019. In. On. On. I left the book on my desk. On means on top of. I like ketchup on my fries. So that means my french fries are here and I like to put ketchup on them. The man is on the roof. The car is on the street. The motorcycle is on my nerves. But, but, I think I remember her name, but I'm not sure. But is a way to add a negative to a sentence. So for example, I really love eating cake, but I don't eat it often because it's not healthy. I'd love to go to the movies with you, but I have too much work to do. I really like you, but I don't want to date you. And, and, and is a very common word you will hear all the time. It's a way of adding on a new subject or thing to your sentence. I love candy and pizza. I'm hungry and I'm tired. My friend moved to Spain and I moved to Canada. I love playing outside and I love being inside. And is a way to add on a new subject or thing to what you're talking about. So, so, 
I have a toothache, so I went to the dentist. So is a way of adding an example, another way to say, because of this, I did this. You say something, and then you add so, and then what follows is the effect. So there's the cause, so the effect. So, I was feeling very hungry, so I had some pizza. This video is going to be pizza themed, everyone, apparently. I was really tired, so I took a nap. I was in the mood for some adventure, so I got on an airplane and flew to Mexico. That sounds nice. Or, or, or is a way of presenting a choice. So for example, you can either have pizza or you can have candy. I don't know if I should go to the movies or if I should go to the mall. Which color do you like better, red or green? It presents differences of choice. Today's video is on words Americans overuse. I haven't seen these words yet, but um, apparently it's gonna be a series of words that we as Americans, I'm American, um, we overuse, we use too often. So let's start. Uh, oh, the first word is definitely. Definitely is definitely a word that Americans overuse. We use it to um, put emphasis at the end of a phrase, to put emphasis at the end of a sentence, uh, as in, oh, that party last week was so great. Yeah, definitely. Or to agree with somebody like that. Uh, oh, God, literally. Oh, just in the last few days, I've seen the word literally so many times on the internet and used in just such stupid ways. The word literally uh, means actually or truly something. This is literally the best hamburger I've ever eaten. So literally meaning truly or actually would mean that in that person's entire life, that is the best hamburger they've ever eaten. However, it gets misused a lot in sentences um, like George Bush was literally supporting the war in Iraq or something like that. Taking a phrase like that literally would have to mean that, you know, the president, the former president would be, you know, physically supporting a war with his body. Onward? Onward. Hilarious. Hilarious is the next word. I like to use the word hilarious when something is actually funny. Um, hilarious, of course, means something that is really funny, super funny. It's a step above funny. Maybe two steps, three steps, I don't know. However, people like to use this word in place of laughter. So, uh, for example, friends are talking, and instead of just laughing, the friend will say, that's hilarious. <laughs> well, if it's so hilarious, just laugh. Oh, this must be the last one, because this is the worst one. This word is like. Um, I've probably said it several times already today. For the, for the purposes of this video, um, the word like is used as a filler word. So it's the same as something such as um or uh or hmm, for example. We use like um, as a filler word when we're trying to think of something. You, it's not uncommon to hear the word repeated like three, four, five times in a row when someone is thinking. They'll say, oh, you know that party that I went to? Like, like, uh, like, uh, like, uh, do you know who was there? It just invades your speech sometimes when you're trying to think of something and no other filler words come out, but the word like does. Ah, this wasn't the last word. There is another one. Seriously. <laughs> Seriously is used. Oh, it's, it's good for any time you receive bad news. Um, well, not from your boss. It's a really casual word. Um, but if you hear something um, like your friend lost their job and you can sympathize with them or maybe empathize with them by saying seriously, oh, that's too bad. Or, oh, tell me like all your problems. Oh my God, I just use like, oh God, oh, I hate myself. Is that the end? Want to speed up your language learning? Take your very first lesson with us. You'll start speaking in minutes and master real conversations. Sign up for your free lifetime account. Just click the link in the description.